Okay, uh, we're here at the Palm Springs Air Museum. Uh, I'm Dr. Dave Thompson, along with Eddie Altshuler. It's uh, January 31st, the year 2002. We're going to interview Arnie Stern. Arnie was born in Poland in 1938, and when the Germans invaded 1939, uh, he and his family moved to the eastern part of the country. And then in 1941, which happened to be a part of Russia at the time, uh, when Germany invaded Russia, they spent the rest of the war moving further and further from the, the German advances. So, and he also uh, has since come to the United States, was in the U.S. Army in 1962. So we're going to talk to him about those things and a lot of other stuff. Nice to have you here, Arnie. Thank you. Okay, tell me again, when and where were you born? Uh, December. 1938 in Warsaw. And uh, what did your dad do? My dad was an accountant. He worked for a company that imported uh, sugar. Um, and then that's what he did at that time. And uh, uh, had your family all, I mean, can you trace back your family a long, long ways? And were they always in Poland? In that no, area? you know, my, my mother and father actually came from Russia. But when they were in their 20s, uh, they moved to Warsaw from this city called Rovno, R-O-V-N-O, which is very close to Kiev. The distances are very short, relatively speaking, so that they didn't have far to go. But Warsaw was a happening town, if you want to use the vernacular. It was a big city, a uh, uh, very large Jewish population, and uh, it was a sophisticated place. So. They moved there uh, long before the war, maybe six, seven years prior to the war, and lived there. And Just to go to a bigger town with more Right, exactly. Okay. And, and your family was Jewish? Right. Uh, you hear of, what do you call it, pog pogroms? Pogroms. Pogroms. Yeah, did you family uh, experience that stuff? I, I think... Uh, my father probably did in his uh, early beginnings. He was born in 1906. And uh, the, you have to uh, understand that the pro pogroms stopped after the revolutions uh, in 1917. Uh, interestingly enough, according to the Russian Constitution, if you ever read it, it sounds uh, as good as Arda's. Uh, everyone was guaranteed freedom, and then anti-Semitism was actually declared illegal as a, as a violating someone's civil rights today in this country is is uh, you know illegal. So uh, from 1906 till the beginning of the revolution in 1917, I am I'm certain that uh, he experienced uh, uh, various let's say hooliganism, uh, which is really a Russian term that we've adopted in, in English. Uh, a hooligan is just a, 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 not, not, a, not even a crook, he's just a, you know, someone that just corrupts, uh, destroys property, uh, uh, a thief, uh, that sort of thing. And there was a lot of that. Uh, perhaps not full-scale pogroms where maybe uh, hundreds and thousands were killed. I don't recall him ever relating that to me, but all kinds of anti-Semitic acts. And uh, did he, uh, before he moved to Warsaw, uh, did, was he doing the same kind of work? He was, he was pretty much an accountant all his life, yeah. or a glorified bookkeeper. Or, you know, that was his profession. Yeah. And was your mom from the same area that you Yeah, had? she was from, from the same community. What did her father do in their background? Her family moved all of them to Israel uh, before the war. Um, I don't think her father did very much. Uh, I don't recall what his source of living was or how he made a living, but her mother was the uh, the, the the breadwinner in that family, I think. She was more aggressive and they had some kind of a business. I don't recall what kind. And, uh, and 
and my father's family was in the lumber business. In a lumber oh. yard. Oh, okay. Um, so in Warsaw, you hear about the ghetto in Warsaw. Is, did you guys live in that area or where? We lived, uh, absolutely. We lived on a street called Nova Lipki. I smell that. Uh, Novo Lipki, N-O-V-O-L-I-P-K-I, Novo Lipki. Uh, it's still there. It's still called Novo Lipki. And uh, it was right around the corner from a street that you may recall because a book was written by Leon Uris called Mila 18. And Mila is another name of a street. So we, we lived in what became ultimately the Warsaw Ghetto. The, the Warsaw Ghetto was nothing more than where most of the Jewish population was. It wasn't a ghetto like we think of as being run down and and, and well, real poor people. Well, parts of it, parts of it may have been run down. Uh, not every, not all, all the Jewish people were well to do. But I mean, the term ghetto. What did what did it mean? Well, ghetto is an Italian word, actually. Uh, it means uh, an area of confinement. Uh, just uh, you, you take a certain number of blocks and you and you cordon them off and that becomes your ghetto. You build a wall around it or a barbed wire and and that's exactly what the Warsaw Ghetto was. It was just uh, that. Um, certain number of blocks. You had wire around it and stuff like that, you mean? Oh sure. Uh, eventually you couldn't you couldn't get out of the ghetto unless you got out through the sewer system or this is what years are we talking about? Right at when, when the ghetto was established, shortly after the war started. This was after the Germans came in? Or, or right. Or they did that, you know? After the Germans arrived, they created uh, just a concentration of people in one area. Which eventually became concentration camps? Or, or no, or, no, no, no. I mean, not that particular the ghettos. Place. The ghettos never became concentration camps. Yeah, I know, no, I know that, but I mean... It was the same idea when they would take people to a, a concentration camp. It was a place less. where you simply concentrated people in a small area so that you could deal with them as they did eventually. Um, did your, okay, well, well, you tell me, what prompted your parents to leave there? And how were they able to get, uh, get away? Well. The Germans physically didn't arrive for about three or four weeks in terms of tanks or soldiers or troops. The, uh, they started to bomb Warsaw on September 1st. Did your parents, uh, obviously you can't, re you can't remember it yourself, I'm no, sure, but I'm have they talked about their experiences with the bombing? And Certainly, stuff? absolutely. And what did they say? Well, the, the bombing was uh, went on uh, continuously for, uh, you know, beginning and then for the many days thereafter and on the fifth day they uh, through the help of his employer who were also Jewish people uh, decided they made the decision to leave Warsaw uh, and they left in an open-air truck with other people perhaps uh, 15 to 20 people and uh, they just brought along a suitcase uh, my dad has an interesting story about how everyone was bringing practically everything they owned and there was no room for people in the truck if, if they took everything. So uh, he was up there and literally throwing off valises and suitcases so that there'd be room for people and giving maybe everyone one suitcase that they could uh, bring along. Uh, and uh, they, they uh, left everything behind. Uh, he had, you know, an apartment, he had an automobile, uh, you know, normal living. I mean, uh, up to the beginning of the war, people lived like they do anywhere in a big city. And he just, they just took off because uh, I'm sure he feared that uh, staying there was uh, not going to work out uh, very successfully. Keep in mind that if you were a literate person, and curious in terms of world affairs, uh, you knew what was coming. The war wasn't a surprise necessarily. Hitler's policies were no surprise. Uh, he made it clear from 1933 onward when he 
And actually, before that, when he, when he wrote his book, Mein Kampf, he told everybody what he was going to do and what his feelings and attitudes were. So uh, my dad didn't feel that staying in Warsaw was a prudent thing to do. And then he also had family uh, a couple hundred miles away in Rovno, you know, his mother and sisters, and, and they were all killed uh, eventually. But uh, then he went there first and uh, stayed there for, what, a year and a half? Or from, night, from September 1939 to June of 1941, almost two years. And, and tell me again where exactly that uh, was, that town, Rovno. Rovno is, uh, I would say, a couple hundred miles east of Warsaw, and uh, maybe 20, 40 miles from Kiev. And you said it was like... It's, a Ukra it's the Ukraine. It's the Ukraine. It was a Russian-occupied part of Poland at the time? No, no, it was Russia. It was Russia. It was Russia. Okay. But it had been, had it been Poland before at one time? It might have been. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't recall. Yeah, okay. Um, and now you said that the family there were all killed. How, how were they killed? Well, they, they stayed. When Hitler invaded Russia, they stayed in their towns. I mean, the, the woman, uh, my grandmother was an elderly woman. I don't know how old she was, but I suspect in her 60s. Uh, my dad, uh, she gave birth to 14 children. And so my dad was the youngest, and he was already 33. Uh, so she was probably in her 70s, maybe even. So they stayed, and of course, uh, the sisters stayed to take care of her. And then they had a business, you know. and. Uh, uh, he could not persuade uh, them to go, and so he and my mother and I just uh, kept going, just took off. And uh, for the next six years, we just kept moving from one place to another. I never had a birthday in the same place twice until I came to the United States. Do you remember any of this? Well, I remember vaguely. Uh, it's difficult to, to know whether you remember something or whether someone or you think you remember it because someone told you an incident. But uh, I suppose I remember some things from the age of four, or five, six, you know, vaguely, vaguely. Uh, we, uh, we wound up almost in Mongolia. That's how far east we went. And all the, all the uh, countries that you are now becoming acquainted with as a result of the uh, issues in Afghanistan such as Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, I lived in all of them. Uh, and those are basically, uh, uh, Central Asia is, was, is the area. Um, Do you remember being frightened at all? No, no, no. I was a kid. Oh, how many, uh, bro did you have brothers and sisters? Uh, yes, but my sister was born after the war. She was born in Poland after the war. So you were the only child? I was the only child. child at that time, yeah. Uh, again, the, your relatives that stayed in that town that died, was that, were they casualties of the war, or did they just some of them get old and died, or did they actually go to concentration camps? No, did they, 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 were, they, they didn't go to any concentration camps. They were killed by, the, by what were referred to as the Einsatzgruppen. Those were uh, German, uh, uh, generally speaking, SS, who would come into an area after the military. They followed the army. And uh, their method of disposing of, of Jews, primarily, and others, too, the gypsies that were, that were taken in, and communists. Uh, so it wasn't only Jews, but predominantly Jews. And uh, they would kill them, and uh, either by shooting them next to ditches, which they usually dug for their, themselves, or they would gas them in these vans, in these self-contained trucks, where the exhaust was rechanneled into the truck, and they would die of asphyxiation. Carbon monoxide. Yeah, or carbon. Uh, that most of them were killed. Uh, the concentration camps didn't really get going until 
with the exception of maybe Dachau, because that was originally created, believe it or not, for not only foreigners or Jews or anyone connected with the war, but they were, it was built for Germans that were out of favor with the Nazis. They were the first ones to occupy Dachau. But the other camps that we're all familiar with, particularly those in Poland, they didn't really come into being until probably 42, you know, until when the war really got going. So did you speak Polish or Russian or both or what? I spoke I spoke uh, Polish and Russian, uh, and uh, depending on uh, not too much. Uh, my my parents probably they spoke Yiddish, but I think when they were speaking amongst them or between themselves, they probably spoke either uh, probably Russian I would think, but maybe Polish as well. Uh, Russian was their mother tongue, I would say. But I, I remember going to schools in uh, places like Tashkent or or uh, Samarkand or you know these these are Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and I, I remember I think I spoke Uzbekish for a while. You know, kids pick up languages real fast, um, so I probably did. I, I mean, I started school in those countries. How close did the Germans get to your family as you were moving along? I don't think we were ever in any danger. Uh, I mean, that's a hard question to answer, but I, I don't think we were. I, we were more in danger of running into uh, the communists, the, the Russians. Uh, after all, uh, they, they wanted... Uh, they were looking for conscripts. They were, my father, partly why he ran was, uh, and continued, to, was, was because he didn't want to go into the Russian army. Uh, that was one part. And uh, also, the locals were dangerous. You know, the Uzbeks, the Kazakhs. Uh, the Rabir. Yeah, Russia. there was no law or order, you know, there was, I mean, there was, but there, there wasn't, and, and we would, uh, my dad, being an accountant, I think, helped him survive because accounting is, first of all, a universal profession. I mean, accounting is accounting is accounting, no matter where you do it. And uh, he was able to get jobs at, uh, you know, like collective farms. Uh, Russia had a lot of collective agriculture. Uh, they were called uh, kolkhoz. Russian and uh, he would uh, always wind up getting a job uh, somewhere and it would at least you know provide food and maybe a little housing uh, what was your father's name Joseph Joe a stern mm -hmm. is they, that they called him Yasso <laughs> is that was it always stern or was it, did it used to be a no, longer name no it's, okay, it's a typical uh, Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty. Uh, Bill Stern, I remember him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, and your mom, what was her maiden name? Lee, her? Lieberman. And her first name? Tanya. T A N Y. T A N I A. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Here. See you later. Yeah. yeah. So you're uh, you're over there um, uh, near Mongolia when the war ends. Yes, we were in Central Asia when the war ended. I, re I remember that day. Believe it or not, uh, yeah. there was uh, there was this every every room that people lived in or apartment, or whatever you want to call it, apartment's probably too fancy a term, had a speaker in the ceiling, you know, in the corner, just a speaker. I think you could turn it on or off, but you had no selection of stations or anything. It was just a way of getting, broadcasting something. And I remember, uh, I remember the day Roosevelt died, and uh, my mother was crying for some reason. I don't know why she 
felt like she had, you know, why, she, why that hit her emotionally that uh, an American president would die. Uh, and uh, the announcement that the war was over. And uh, repatriation began. That would be the war in Europe, probably? Yes, yes, yes. V.E. Day. Right. Uh, so, did you, how long did you, your family stay where you were at that time after that? We, we went to a, uh, there were various committees set up to repatriate, repatriate people who have become victims of the war. Uh, and uh, we wound up in a displaced persons camp somehow in Germany, in Bavaria, in a place called Eindring. I don't know where it is exactly, but um, and we were there for about six months, DP camps. They were all over. Yeah, I've heard it. And, uh, and then we went uh, back to Poland. Warsaw. No, no, we went to, we went, Warsaw was demolished. There was nothing left of Warsaw. Uh, we went to Lodz, the next biggest city. We had some friends, or relative friends that were living in Lodz. We stayed with them for a while. And then uh, wound up in uh, Paris, France. How did that happen? See, there was, a committee called the Joint, J-O-I-N-T, was the Joint Something Distribution Committee for Refugees. And I think it was American-sponsored, I'm not sure. Anyway, they were uh, involved in uh, repatriation and also uh, bringing back those Jews that were all over Europe. Uh, some in hiding, some in the camps, some uh, in the DP camps, and, and so forth. And uh, they would uh, set up residence. I mean, no one had any money, uh, so they had to provide uh, you with uh, lodging and, and uh, food. And I remember uh, we lived in two places in France. One was outside of Paris. Uh, in a kind of a rural setting. I don't think we did anything there, except just we were there. And then we moved literally into Paris at the uh, Hotel Mirabeau on, on uh, Rue Emile Zola. I visited that place, it's still there. It's an old hotel. Um, and we lived there for a while, looking for a visa. To, to, my father wanted to leave Europe, had enough of Europe. Uh, you know, the war lasted almost six years, from 1939 to 1945. Uh, and uh, he just uh, had enough of uh, living in uh, that part of the world, and he wanted to try uh, living in uh, the Western Hemisphere. He had relatives here in America that came here before the war. He had two brothers and a sister. So we we um, managed to get a visa to the United States, which uh, was amazing. Yeah. What year did you did you end up coming here then? We arrived here in August of 1947. Came over on a French troop carrier. Um, what did what was involved in getting the visa? Well, you you couldn't. There weren't any visas available to the United States or or Canada. 
or Brazil, where my father, run my, where my mother had a sist, a brother. Um, however, uh, there was an interesting uh, aspect to this. If you were a clergyman, and I'm not sure what how that would be defined, and uh, could obtain a position in the United States as a clergyman, you could uh, come under the quota, under the B. You would be you would be granted a visa. You would be granted entry into the U.S. So through some shirt tail relatives in New York. Who arranged for my dad, who was quite a learned uh, Jew, learned in the cult, not only culture but in the religious aspects of Judaism, just because he came from an Orthodox family. Uh, there was a, a school in Brooklyn, a yeshiva. A yeshiva is a school for religious study. And uh, these people arranged for them, for the yeshiva, to hire my father. Uh, he never went to work for them, but uh, that was perhaps a bit of a ruse, I don't know. Anyway, got him into the United States, and uh, we lived in New York for a short time. So you came, you guys came with him? With the, did he have to come first? And no, said, no, we all, the yeah. four of us came together. Four people in one suitcase came right into New York. Ellis Island was either closed by then, I think it was. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. So we just arrived in Brooklyn. What, what was your sister's name? Uh, Joan. And how long did you stay in New York then? Oh, probably a uh, month, month and a half, two months with some people. These people, these short tail relatives. And then we uh, drove a car. We were driven in a car to St. Paul, Minnesota, where my dad's sister lived. So did you stay with them for a while? Or did we did, yeah, a couple months. And then got an apartment and uh, my father got a job again as an accountant. Now, did uh, did your dad, did Andy speak any English? He spoke barely. I mean, a little bit. I, I didn't at all, and my mother didn't at all. Now, do you remember this part? Do you remember coming to yeah. St. Paul? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was eight and a half. Yeah, and so you, st what, oh, well, tell me, what grade school did you go to, what grammar school? Uh, Ramsey was the first one. I went to a school in Brooklyn for a short time. Uh, okay, you didn't speak English, so how how did that work when you started school? I, again, just picked it up. Right? Yeah, I mean, children, I think, uh, are unbelievable when it comes to picking up language. Right. Uh, I, I don't remember, I remember struggling with it in New York a little bit. Kids laughing, you know, when you said things inappropriate or incorrectly. But uh, I don't remember much difficulty when I was in St. Paul. I really don't. And uh, uh, then where did you, did you go to junior high and then to high school? Or? I went to high school. Uh, what was it, what high school did you go to? Central, St. Paul. Did you play any sports in school? Uh, played a little hockey uh, and uh, golf. My better days. <laughs> Didn't play tennis then? No, no, not, not really. Yeah. And uh, did you like, uh, what classes did you like the best in school? Oh, probably history, geography, history, uh, and, uh, you know, mathematics. I was oh, pretty good there too. English. Was there a large Jewish uh, community there? No, no. Not at all. Not at all. But there were some. There were some, yeah. And, and so did you, did your family continue going to temple and, and stuff like that? Uh, 
Some, some, not a lot. On the high, on the high holidays, maybe. Uh, my father uh, was really not a very religious man. My mother probably was more so. But whatever they did was probably to please uh, his sister, who was, I would say, probably Orthodox or close to it. Uh, but uh, after my mother passed away, uh, we didn't do anything. So the neighborhood that you lived in was it an ethnic neighborhood? It was Saint Paul. Uh -huh. The first neighborhood. The first neighborhood was a very very poor neighborhood. Um, some immigrants, a uh, fair number of Jewish families. Uh, the neighborhood doesn't exist anymore. It's, it's a freeway now, but there were two synagogues, both Orthodox. So uh, usually where there are synagogues, there are Jewish people living nearby uh, for no other reason than that you cannot drive on the Sabbath. And, or take any other public transportation. So you have to walk to the synagogue. And Orthodox Jews tend to live close to their synagogues. How long did you live in that neighborhood? Oh, from 1947 to 1951. And then where, then where did you move? To a, to a, we upgraded to a little better neighborhood. Um, First, the first apartment on was called 13th Street. We were paying $18 a month in rent, if you can imagine that. But then my dad was earning 90 cents an hour in 1947. Yeah. <laughs> uh, unbelievable. Did he work for a company or did he have he, his own company? No, no, right? he worked for uh, the William Harris Woolen Company in St. Paul which was in the business of importing fabric and selling it to tailors to make generally men's clothing suits and that sort of thing. And of course that business died out eventually because nobody, and men quit buying, quit having suits tailor made uh, and you know bought them off the rack. So that business eventually died and he uh, went to work for the sons of the owner in Chicago in 1958. And, that's, and that he and my sister moved to Chicago in 1958. And he continued there till uh, he retired in 19, I forget what, 1990? Uh, yeah, 1990. He was, uh, 85 years old when he finally, when he was asked to retire, he was actually terminated. <laughs> uh, your mother didn't go with him? My mother passed away in 1951 at the age of 39 from Hodgkin's and uh, so she, she, didn't, she didn't last long in this country. She, she was here for four years. That's probably pretty hard on you at your age, wasn't it? Yeah, it was hard on, I'm sure, not only me, but my father. And my sister was only six. Um, just turned six. So, yeah, it was, it was tough on him, you know, to go through that whole war with a woman and then have her pass away when you finally, you know, survive it and make it to the United States. And, so when they moved, how old were you when they moved to Chicago? I was 19. Oh, you're 19. Okay. Uh, so what did you do after you graduated from high school? Well, I went into uh, I went to the University of Minnesota and uh, obtained a B.S. or B.A. in political science, and uh, then I uh, went to law school at the University of Minnesota. And Army, and then went back to law school. And well, you, did you call in during Korea? Or no, or no, 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 no. Or Vietnam when that was. No, actually, it was pre-Vietnam. Right. Uh, Sixty-two, did you say? Yeah, 
fought, the only conflict that our country was involved in at that time was Laos. Were you drafted? Um, no, I enlisted. I would have been drafted had I not enlisted. So, uh, yeah. I, uh, tried to, I, I went and got a commission in the Air Force as a, I wanted to be a pilot, so they offered me a commission as an air policeman in the APs. Yeah. So I turned them down. Then I went to the Navy, and I wanted to be a pilot, and they accepted me as a, as a naval air cadet with a five and a half year enlistment. And what saved me, if it, if it saved me, from becoming a, from going into the Navy and presumably becoming a pilot if you get through it, uh, was uh, a car that wouldn't start. It was February in Minnesota, freezing cold, and I was driving this old beater, and I couldn't start it. And I couldn't go down to the Navy, Naval Air Station to get sworn in. It was just that. I mean, that was the whole story. Uh, they kept calling me to come down and get sworn in and so they could con finish processing my paperwork. Um, I really had to push this whole commission application through with the aid of Senator uh, Eugene McCarthy. At that time, he was a Minnesota senator. And uh, when I finally got the appointment or the commission, uh, they kept calling me up to come down and I was supposed to report to Pensacola, Florida on St. Valentine's Day, which is like coming up. And uh, I just simply couldn't get my car started. So one day we were, I was living with three other guys that were already working. They weren't in school. And uh, one of them said, hey, look here, uh, the Army Reserve Program just lifted their age ceiling to 27 and I was like 23 I think and prior to that it was the reserves weren't available to me so I waited five and a half years with the Navy although I wanted to fly and I did become a pilot on my own uh, or six months in the Army Reserves and then summer camps and so on so I opted out for the reserves and uh, thought I would kind of coast through, but through various reorganizations of our units, believe it or not, I wound up attached to the uh, 82nd Airborne in Fort Bragg. <laughs> and, uh, and see, th these were all quartermaster units, and so they merged them all, and somehow or other, the next thing I know, we're uh, repairing parachutes at Fort Bragg, and if you're a rigger of shoots or a repairman of shoots, you must become jump qualified. And for obvious reasons, they want to make sure that you're paying attention when you're sewing those shoots together or or rigging them. So uh, what I thought was going to be a, a relatively safe environment. <laughs> And, uh, and originally a bakery unit <laughs> as a clerk typist. <laughs> uh, next thing I know, I'm, I'm jumping out of, you know, aircraft. Uh, How many jumps did you make? Six. <laughs> what was that like? That was interesting. You know, that was kind of fun, actually. Uh, they, they, tr they train you so, you know, you gradually get to that level. I mean, I've obviously, you know, they'll just take you up in an airplane right. and throw you out yeah. of your aircraft. You, you, know, you had pretty good landing, so now you just... Yeah, yeah, that was that was the, the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> Did you stay at Bragg the whole time before you got out? No, no, Fort Leonard Wood uh, for basic and then also the second eight and then uh, Fort Bragg uh, in summers, summers, oh, okay. like. Well, that's if you're in the reserves, right? So right. you would you'd be in school for like during the winter and then go. Right, and right. Sit. We had we had to go to weekly meetings mm -hmm. uh, every week at night, yeah. and then 
two weeks summer camp. Yeah, and so how, how long was it? How many? Six years. Six years. So by this time, have you graduated from law school? I mean, as far as your... No. Uh, well, yes. Uh, yes, I did. Eventually, I... Uh, or when did you graduate from law school? I graduated in 1965. So, um, and at that point, uh, I uh, joined the uh, Judge Advocate General JAG unit, and I finished up my uh, illustrious military career <laughs> in a JAG unit at uh, Fort Snelling, Minnesota. Now, have, uh, are you married by this time? No. Never been. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so what did you do after you graduated from law school? Then? I uh, went to, uh, well, I was working with some couple of small law firms, but uh, shortly uh, after that experience, I went into uh, business and uh, opened up. Uh, not at one time, but a series of uh, recru recruiting firms, employment agencies, and we had about a half a dozen of them at one time. All in the Minneapolis, all in the area. city area, yeah. yeah. And then uh, also uh, some real estate deals. Uh, owned an indoor tennis club for a few years, built it, and ran it for five years. And then so when you started playing tennis. That was probably probably when I started to play it with some frequency and seriousness, yeah. Um, and then uh, essentially retired in 1990. When did you first start coming to the desert? 1990. And uh, did you start coming to Mission Hills right away, or when you were, yeah? Did you get your did you play, so? That was my. Uh, I joined Mission Hills uh, in the fall of 1990 as a golfing member, and uh, and then I didn't. There were a couple of winters when I probably didn't come here. I went to I tried Scottsdale one winter and I tried uh, Florida one winter, but uh, but other than that, I've been coming here in the winters and now I'm spending actually probably but equal time between California and Minnesota. What do you do in Minnesota during the summer? Um, well, I still have one employment agency left that I just oversee from a distance, so that doesn't occupy a lot of time. But I uh, play a lot of golf. And uh, uh, Tell me about uh the Spielberg project, how you got, when, when and how you got involved with that, what that entailed? Uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, oh, I'm going to say about four or five years ago, found, funded a an organization called the SHOA Foundation. S-H-O-A. Uh, SHOA, uh, that's a good one. Uh, S it's S-H for sure, show, S-H-O, boy, you've got me. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I've seen, I, I think I told you my next door neighbor uh, uh, was interviewed and she gave me her tape, so I, I know what the, it is. Um, the, um, I should know how to spell it. It might be S-H-O-A-H, I think. I think that's what I thought. Shoah in Hebrew means Holocaust. And uh, his purpose was, this was also about the time that he was either producing or maybe already finished producing Schindler's List. He became very interested in preserving <coughs> on film uh, the uh, historical uh, biography, autobiography. Uh, of the people that survived the Holocaust. Uh, all kinds of people from all over the world. This was an international project. 
wherever there were Jew Jews that survived or had any contact with that period, he would like to have interviewed them. And so I interviewed uh, a number of the survivors in Minnesota, in, in the Twin City area, because that's where I live. And um, how many do you recall about how many that you interviewed? About ten women. And um, we uh, then the tapes were sent to Los Angeles where they were processed um, and classified and indexed. And uh, I don't, I haven't had much contact with that since those days, but <clears throat> the theory was that anybody, scholars in particular, or researchers or writers, historians, would be able to access those uh, films uh, by, through the internet or I, I don't know how, but not, not, not having to go there physically. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, the, um, the idea was to capture these people before they all died. And uh, each day we're, we're losing, obviously, some of them. And at some point there won't be anybody that will remember the, uh, the history. And I think he was concerned about the fact that, uh, you know, there were revisionists that were, you know, historical revisionists that uh, were making outlandish statements that had never occurred and that it's all uh, propaganda and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, I think it, it was a good thing to do. So, um, you went to their homes? Yeah, we, we did it in their homes, uh, ideally, and, uh, unless it was impossible for some reason. But we did it in the home uh, with a videographer and an assistant. And, uh, and we would just do a two to three hour interview, oral interview, of, of, and take their oral history. Was it difficult for you? <coughs> Did some of them break down? Oh yes, down? yes. Uh, some some of them broke down before you even got to the subject. Uh, many of them didn't want to be interviewed. Uh, they were oftentimes persuaded by their children because the children wanted a record of, uh, of their parents, uh, especially the children that were born in this country or that perhaps came over as young children such as myself, uh, you, you want a record, you know. So the, the children had encouraged the parents. And uh, I had one woman that there was a battle right down to the wire, and eventually, and finally she didn't want to do it. She didn't. Yeah, for them, it's, it can be very painful. Uh, the stories are beyond uh, description, beyond our imagination, you know how people can uh, survive the circumstances under which some of these people survived. Unbelievable. Uh, just uh, mind-boggling. So I think, I think it served a purpose, I hope. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, in terms of educating future generations, but you know, who knows? That's, that's, a, that's a speculation. Well, if nothing else, it's something for the families. That they made. It's, right. it's a record for the family themselves. That's right. Because I know, I'm yeah. sure you gave one to the family or whatever. They, they oh, absolutely. Whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it was also interesting in the sense that at the end of each film, <clears throat> we would uh, have whatever family members were available gather around the interviewee, um, sometimes a husband and wife, sometimes just an individual, uh, most, mostly an, an individual rather than a couple. And um, then the whole family would uh, surround that person and it would give you a, 
with the idea that from this person that could have easily died emerged all these people, the, the children and the grandchildren. And so that, that, that was a, a very gratifying experience. Um, a worthwhile project, absolutely. Barney, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you for coming in. Yeah. Let's set this baby down here. Well, Dad, this is uh, an attempt uh, on our part to just create something for posterity about your life and uh, how you've lived it, where you grew up, and mostly autobiographical. Uh, why don't we start with uh, where you were born? I was born in a, a middle-sized town by the name of Novograd Volinsk. Uh, this is uh, in Eastern Europe, and it was part of the Russian Empire. And I was born uh, October 14, 1906, what is later changed to October 27, because the Russian, after the revolution, changed the calendar from the Julian to the Gregorian. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Everything was kind of normal, like uh, the life in a small town. I didn't, I don't remember my father. He was, he had tuberculosis. He died at the age of 42, but I never, most of the time, didn't see him because he used to go south of Ukraine, where all the people uh, sick and uh, tuberculosis. Uh -huh. uh, it was a better climate, usually pine. Pine forest, pine yeah. tree forest. What business know. was the family in? in the, they were in the in in, in the, the firewood business, you know, not lumber, but firewood. Mm -hmm. Buy uh, certain trees from the landlords, you uh -huh. know, hire people, cut the trees, cut them to the same standard size, mm -hmm. and supply the city, the private people, the army, and everybody else. With firewood. So the uh, so your mother raised the family. My mother, and at that time was already an older brother. What uh, he was at that time, and I was born. He, he, when he was at, uh, 21, I was seven. Probably it was a big spread between. Uh -huh. My mother gave birth to 11 children. 11 children. Yeah, three of them died in infancy. Uh huh. So I knew four more brothers and three sisters. Mm hmm was his mm -hmm. age. Some of the uh, siblings you had emigrated to the United States, where did the others go? Uh, up to 1917, as I mentioned, life was kind of normal. You never had the children, you know, my older brother and the second brother pitched in, in the business, and we would consider that I was a middle class. This was true till 1917, when the first part of the revolution started in February what was a democratic government for six months. You, maybe you heard the name of Kerensky. Kerensky. He died Alexander in the United Kerensky. States. Alexander Kerensky was a social revolutionary. He was the head of the government. And, uh, and then the, Bolsh the, the Bolshevik faction of the uh, population was, uh, was very aggressive, advocating to, uh, to make a separate peace with the Germans. Mm -hmm. you know, but Kerensky and some other parties advocate to continue the war till the last uh, uh, German soldier leaves our sacred land, whatever it is. And, and prior to that, it was uh, the Tsar government. The, yes. the government was under Nicolai, the Tsar, Nicholas II. And you know, naturally, in the meantime, <clears throat> what didn't affect our life is something. Well, the famous Rasputin story, I don't know if you know, I heard about Rasputin. Well, so what was, was life normal. like under the Tsar? Well, you know, we hear a lot about the pogroms, uh, especially against well, Jewish well, people. Luckily, up to 1917, there was no pogrom in our town. It was in 1918, 1918 and 19. 
programs made by the Ukrainian. Ukrainian were at the same time fighting for their independence. You know, at that time, Ukraine was occupied with Germans. They came to our town in 1915, where we lived, you see. And they put in a puppet government in Kiev. They, they were in Kiev too. They were, went far east, the far east for the Germans. And, uh, and then, you know, in 1917, in October, came the Bolshevik Revolution and the Civil War. And a civil war is difficult to describe unless you really, uh, you know, know all the history, like I would say an example uh, of what I would call a civil war. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina now, what's currently, mm -hmm. the Serbs killing the, 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 the Muslims or the, mm -hmm. the Bosnians. This is the way civil war. You get out in the morning, it looks like peaceful, in the afternoon comes in a gang, or at that time, you know, the artillery was already invented just to shell with artillery. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you don't know in the morning what, uh, what government will wind up in the evening. And this it was uh, for a long time, like uh, almost three years. After three years in 1920 was the last war in Europe, in Eastern Europe, was between uh, the Soviet uh, Union and uh, in Polish Army. As a matter of fact, the Soviet Union was not called yet the Soviet Union at the time. And, uh, and they decided in, to sign a peace treaty in Latvia, in Riga, the capital. And uh, the Russians gave up some Ukrainian territory to the Poles. So we lived in a place, you know, where our, our town, where we live in Novograd, Volinsk, was on the border, but it was within the, within the border of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So the, the same day we... Well, we you, were, you were like 10, 11 years old at the time of the uh, revolution. 11 years old. Was there a major difference uh, in day-to-day -day life after the revolution? Oh, the, the, after the revolution, we say it was a civil war, the schools were not normal. You, 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 there might be weeks you, weeks you didn't go to school. You spend a lot of days in a cellar, what's an outside cellar of the building, just to protect yourself from uh, shells, from artillery shells, and from some intruders who just came to kill you. How long uh, was the period uh, of the Civil War? The Civil War was three years. So from 1917 Changing, to 1920? From October 17, you can say if you pink October. Because don't forget that the October Revolution was started. You just started in, Le in Leningrad at that time. Saint, uh, it was Petrograd. St. Petersburg. No, Petrograd. 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 You know, because the Tsar changed the name from St. Petersburg mm -hmm. to Petrograd. What, what happened to be that the American press never mentioned it. They jumped back to St. Petersburg. In the meantime, it was under the Tsar was St. Petersburg, and then because there was a, was a war with Germany, in Berg is in German means a city. Mm -hmm. So the Russian government, the Tsar, decided to change it to Grad what is also means city in Russian in church Russian in there is a language church Russian I see, I see. so in the meantime well, now it's back to St. Uh, Petersburg so the, the revolution mm. lasted a, approximately three years so when they say the 1917 revolution it really started in 17 oh, but there were civil wars going on yet in other territories I see of Russia and I can name you the generals you see you're the posters you'll go, you should see the posters again You'll find the name the, in the south was Wrangel, in the, in the Siberia was Kolchak, mm -hmm. in, uh, in St. Petersburg was Eugenich. I don't know, I forget what was, uh, was happening 10 minutes ago, but I remember the name of the generals. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, for three years now, now you're like uh, 12, 13, 14 years old approximately during, <laughs> during the period of this civil war in the area that you lived in. Yeah. In Novograd Volinsk, which is uh, which is, if I'm not mistaken, on the furthest eastern western side of the Soviet Union of Russia. That's correct. It's almost uh, it's almost in Poland, isn't it? Three miles from the border. Of Poland. Poland. I I, 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 I crossed. I, I walked over under the under the gate, 
where the guard was. Mm -hmm. You know, I walked over and, and I was in Poland in uh, five minutes, in the less than that. I see. You know, but I was waiting for the rest of the family because you have to bribe the, the, the guard. Uh, you have to, it wasn't easy because the, the, the same day they signed the treaty in Riga yeah. w was already uh, the Mackay uh, well, line. Now tell me, uh, at, were you, was the entire family still together in, during the revolution? Uh, yes. We, uh, we, uh, together and with the grandmother. I see. And uh, what, what was the name of, uh, the last name of your mother before she married uh, your dad? Finkelstein. Finkelstein was her name. Yes. I see. And uh, was Stern My the same name? I mean, was it Stern different in, spelling. in, in uh, Europe also at different, that time? With different spelling. But pronounced the same? We pronounced uh, some pronounced Stern, some Stern, uh -huh. some Stern. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we decided that uh, it makes sense to him. Once the uh, Bolshevik uh, revolution was over, did life uh, resume uh, normality? Did it come back to routine? It was a complete change because they took away anything private to your own. They didn't take long to close all the stores, you know. Well, However, I was, if you had to go with the history, yes. At least you have to remember that uh, under Lenin, what was very famous in history, he decreed what is called the NEP, the New Economic Policy, NEP. Uh -huh. And he re uh, relaxed the statism rules. You, can have, you could open a store, you can, you can do anything. He thought uh, it's important to make life easier for, for the people. But it didn't last long, and especially last almost to Stalin's uh, uh, coming to power. In most of the NEPs, the NEP people, the NEP men, what yeah. they were called, all sent to Siberia. Now, your 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 family stayed in Novograd, Volinsk, or they moved? We, for a while, we stayed in Novograd, Volinsk. And then then you moved, didn't you? Basically, we left Novograd, Volinsk because after the, as I mentioned, the Riga tra uh, Treaty. The Novodolinsk was in the Soviet Union, and five miles west of Novodolinsk was Poland. Then you moved to Poland. It's a, it's a small town by the name of Kozhets. We were not too long there. My elder sister married there, we yeah. stayed there a few days. And then we moved to Rovno because Rovno was a bigger city, more opportunities. Was Rovno historically Polish or Russian? Yeah, historically, uh, the name of the country, is Ukraine. The Russian used to call it Malo Russia, means Little Russia. Mm -hmm. This was the official Zara's name. Mm -hmm. But the name is U Ukra Ukraine. It was part of the Russian Empire. I see. So was Poland part of the Russian Empire. What year did the family move to Rovno? In 1920, in, uh, past November, December. Okay, so now you're about 14 years old at the time. That's correct. And uh, did, did the business continue, the family business, the lumber business? No, no. The lumber business, uh, uh, actually, it was kind of over after even the first revolution. Because the peasants come in, all the inventory, what is firewood, I told you, yeah. put in stock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they took it home. They, in one day, you were clear of inventory. Never went no, back to No that. police, no nothing. I mean, no, you... No, no, police. <laughs> I'm kidding. How did the uh, family uh, survive economically? All right, I see the economic came. My mother opened a little stationery store. Uh, Dave Efron used to go a little to bigger cities. Dave Efron so, married your sister. Yes, uh, yeah, to get some supplies. You know, he was already that you know engaged to be married his sister, and it was miserable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's very simple. So. Let's let's go on with the with the years now. Now you're living in Rovno with the family, and uh, you presumably you graduate from some kind of a high school or. Yeah, no, it is a high school. It was, was a lot of missing or something like that. I got out from high school. I would say in the end of the junior year, I made my senior year with a higher tutor. You know, used to come to me. Mm -hmm. I got a part-time job. Mm -hmm. 
as a bookkeeper. I went to a private uh, accounting school by 15. When I was 15, I had a diploma when I was an accountant. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and were you Is working full time then? The were you no, working full -time? in the beginning, part time. Didn't want to give up school. Then, you, uh, you eat is more important than, uh, than yeah. school. How long did you live in Rovno? I was working in Rovno. Well, you lived in Rovno, in a branch of the main office of the come of the radar, what was distribution of sugar. Mm -hmm. So in '27, the old man called up his son. His son was the manager. 1927. 1927. The son was the manager of the Rovner branch or something. Yeah, yeah. He says, my father wants you being versus he screwed up the bookkeeping. I mean, you're, you're like, what, 21 at this point, 1927. That's right. That's okay. Right. And uh, would you accept uh, the job? You know, and they know they, they did everything. They, that's, uh, the, the old man in Warsaw, but what I never met before turned out to be my benefactor, no doubt. So at the age of 21, approximately, you moved to Warsaw? Yep, by myself. Your, your, your mother tongue is Russian, right? The yes. first language you yeah. ever learned to speak yeah. was Russian. Yeah. The family spoke yeah. Russian at home. Polish. Or did they speak Yiddish also? Yiddish, Russian, and that's it. But not Polish? Uh, yeah, study, no, not Polish. Your no. mother didn't speak Polish? No. Oh, she knew a little bit because the, 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 the trees, what I mentioned before, we used to buy in order to produce the, yes. the firewood. Most of the owners of the forces were Polish land, landlords. I see. Just so where, where did you learn to speak Polish? When did you learn to speak in, Polish? In, uh, when we went to Rovno. When, to Rovno. Rovno. when we came to Rovno, and the, and the, the, the language of the country is Polish. In the school was Polish. I see. One year still I was in a Russian school. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. give him a year. Then it was divided. It was Russian schools, Polish schools, separately. Okay. So now at, at, at 21 you moved to Warsaw, yep. Poland. Yeah. And single, obviously, at the time. And uh, see, I enrolled in the evening at the, at the university, which was very cheap, almost nothing. Tried to do that. And then uh, I give it up to. Dad, describe uh, a little bit the uh, life in Warsaw in the middle, late 20s when you moved there to work for the Raider family. The, the, the normal the life was work. Working late hours many times. You know, I had a very responsible job. This was the father, I told you, of the manager of the. Uh, manager, uh, the, uh, his son, but he was the manager in Rovno before I went to Warsaw. Right. And I had a lot of friends from Rovno where they happened to live in Warsaw because he went to university. In Poland, you couldn't live in a city that you have a university. Rovno never had a university. Sure. So there are only four or five cities in Poland. Uh, you know, this would be Warsaw, Poznan, uh, Lwów, Lodz, mm -hmm. or something like that. You see, so we were a lot. Uh, we used to pay a lot of cards, you know. The, the, the name was either poker or bridge, only mm -hmm. confined to these mm -hmm. two names. Having a lot of parties, you know. The United Bachelor lived in a room in a hotel, mm -hmm. what on the fifth floor. What the fifth floor was actually a residential hotel. Mm -hmm. All the four floors were normal, very fancy one, mm -hmm. old-fashioned, interesting, architecturally speaking, in the structure. And you live like um, any young bachelor would live, you know. Let me go back a little. Uh, tell me about life in uh, Poland. Was it a split society, Jewish culture, uh, institutions? Uh, what, was, what was the feeling you had for the society at that time? There was no doubt that there, were, there was anti-Semitism in Poland. I didn't feel it. You know, I have a few episodes I, I could tell when I feel it. When I was rowing a boat with a friend, non-Jewish, we were rowing a boat from Warsaw on the river Vistula to Danzig. To, that was called Gdansk, you know, to the Baltic Sea. Yes. Ro rowing, just two of us. Yes. You know, when we used to stop. Now, I couldn't be a member of, of the club he belonged to, but they did enroll me as a guest. They uh, didn't admit Jews into the rowing clubs? That's correct. 
So the, the, they knew he told him. And I, I never I fished, but I, never, I, I was never hiding the name of Jew. But uh, I never came to a, a party and says, you know, I am Jewish, would you accept me? Yeah, I understand. Uh, yeah, because on the part of our people, uh, very, uh, you know, and there was a few episodes, maybe it's worthwhile talking, uh, that I went vacation with my friend, but we went rowing, what I mentioned. And he uh, rented a, a cottage there for me in, uh, in uh, Tanya, you know, your mother went with me. At two o'clock in the morning, we over, overheard a conversation, you know, with my friend, because he rented it, telling him that comes, you know, the, you know next day, next morning, comes morning, we should move out because they didn't know that Tanya and I are Jewish and our uh, houses are sacred and no Jew is permitted to, to stay one night. I see. So five o'clock in the morning, we moved out, and we went to a Jewish camp. <laughs> Let me make you this uh, as a contrast. Is there a major difference in anti-Semitism uh, between Europe at that time and this country? There's no comparison. In the years of, years of one effect maybe is not so important, it is important, in, in Warsaw that the students, non-Jewish students, when they organized in corporation fraternities, okay, yes. used to buy specifically thick, you know, canes and walk on the street and look you in the face and it seems to, to them, you appear Jewish, hit you over the head with a cane. In Warsaw? Yeah. It would last a few hours a day, but it's not. No kidding. Yeah. And there was no action that anyone could take There's that no wasn't way. against the law? No, or every action you live with it because it's a minor thing in the temple. So Poland, yeah. Poland was a very virulent anti-Semitic society. I could not Is that in right? Tennis, what, what? Anti-Semitic society. You, you, I don't think you can spread, you can generalize, you know, and say society by anti-Semitism. My friend, I say, it's not a saying, oh, the best friends are non Jewish Sunday. But it happened to be my best friend was not Jewish, was the most beautiful human but, but being. But in, in general <laughs> terms, was, was it in a. In general terms. We don't give a cup and think, you know. You read the papers or anything else, it's peaceful. Were there hotels where Jews could not stay? I don't think so. How about restaurants that they couldn't go no, into? No, I, I could go anywhere I want. So it wasn't that kind of. It wasn't that kind of unless you, you are not admitted to the Lawn Tennis, tennis Association. You might not be admitted to exclusive clubs, what is gentle well, zone. We have that here in this country, then, yes, too. Certainly. If you, you, so in this respect, it's a little similar. Let's go back. Uh, to, but there was no pogroms. Involved. Let's go back to Warsaw for a moment. <coughs> now, you, now you're working for this company, and you're a bachelor, and you're making some money, I presume. When did you get married? 26. You were 26 years old? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think so. So, you knew her from Rovno, right? I knew her from Rovno when she was eight years old. I haven't seen her for 10 years, and I met her again when she was 18. I see. In Rovno. I see. And I fell in love immediately. So, uh, she, uh, you married her, and then she moved to Warsaw to join you, obviously. Okay. So and, and the two of you lived in Warsaw uh, right up until the beginning of World War II. Almost. We, we, yeah. we had to change because there were the changes in the hotel there, so we moved. But you on. lived in Warsaw, no? Lived in Warsaw. The entire time? Yeah, and then it was uh, my, my, my boss, the company I worked for, they, were on, uh, they own about five uh, apartment houses in Warsaw. Yeah. So then when the, uh, when the first... Uh, uh, apartment it was vacant mm -hmm. in, in, in Tanya, uh, was already pregnant. I, I got an apartment in the building. What was your uh, position at the company that you worked for in Warsaw? You call it the uh, manager accountant, uh, something like that. There were okay. two daughters managers in, in, uh, in, in two sons, one in Rovna, one in Warsaw. Earning a good living. And I got a living. I mean, uh, relatively so speaking. Because at that time, the problem <coughs> was I couldn't use my own income. I shared this income with my mother. You half of my you income. Su you supported your mother back in Rovno. My mother, two, two, two sisters, and a brother-in-law. 
was for while they were unemployed or something. When did your brothers, Isaac, Mitchell, uh, and the, uh, the other one who went to Argentina, when did they leave? Oh, the, the Argentina went very early. This was 19, 1924, I okay. think. Okay. And Mitchell left in 1920, and Isaac left in 1921. Oh, very close within a year. What, what was the... We, you know, we, we obviously know that this country had a lot of immigration from all over the world, especially Eastern Europe and Western yeah, Europe yeah. Uh, at that time of, of history. But what was the primary reason that your brothers and people like them left their families and their homes to go to a, a strange you country? You economics? You when you ask the company, economics would be one. Programs would be another one. It doesn't matter that in our city. That we're now we're getting there. now the po programs just for for oh, definition. We're against Jews, right? A Absolutely. pogrom by po definition is against. Uh, yes, violence against Jews in, in Russia at some that time. Including including killing some, including all. I mean, the, these all were the conducted the by uh, what street uh, gangs, uh, hooligans, uh, bands of just, people. Just, just part of the population, but. Uh, yeah. You would consider normal people, but unorganized, they, they organized. Were there groups no, that were organized under some kind of a banner? But they were organizers. There's always leaders, you know. Let's go. And there are some programs for just robbing the stores, smashing and robbing, you know. And no one had recourse against that. I mean, uh, just you don't even you, you don't know, even yeah. try. Do to, yeah. So it was for those reasons you say that the, the day left. The biggest was for 1905 because. Uh, Russia lost the war to Japan. Let me ask you this. Now, as a, as a young man, <coughs> and your brothers are leaving, and, and uh, I presume to some degree you looked up to your brothers, yeah, why, why, didn't you, why didn't you follow yeah, well, at that well, time? First of all, I'm a child yet. No, I'm speaking now of... Not follow. Why do later follow? Yeah. yeah. I, had, uh, the, I have the best of my life in, in Warsaw, for your information. You asked before what it was. It was very fun living in Warsaw, making a living. I was not too excited to go to uh, America, to the United States. First of all, the quarters, it was closed. You, you, I must say, if I did decide to go, forget about it. I see. When they went, they could have gotten in, obviously. That's right. It was a refuge. Then they closed the quarters. Like you know, he couldn't go. And then I have mixed feeling about it. As a matter of fact, oh, in 39, I almost went to the United States. I already called to books and like that. So the war started, uh, it was already two miles, yeah. so I didn't go. In 39, go to the World Fair in New York. In 39, I think it was the World Fair, mm -hmm. I think so. And I was also, I can take a look at what America. Then, you are, what, what we read about the United States, in every, most of the people live two reasons, anti-Semitism in economics. Yes. Unemployment, something like that. But the, the, oh, I myself was really being yet in, in Europe, was not impressed from the literature I read about, uh, you know, I see. as I see and mentioned. I said, what's the big deal? They're going there. Usually, because most of, most of the people would be blue collar workers when they went to America. Or uh, there's an expression called Luftmensch. You ask him what he's doing, he himself doesn't know where he makes a living. He goes on the market, he buys this, this and this, you Peddlers. know. Peddlers. Uh, like, like peddler types and like that. And here you have such a, a good job, you know, and uh, people like you, and you can sit like forever, you know, and you have a good time. Mm -hmm. And why would I sing it? And don't forget, I have to start, I have a matter what I supported by b being in Warsaw, would I know that I go to the United States and I keep on supporting my mother? You never know. In uh, reading about uh, uh, coming, uh, you know, American writers or Jewish American writers, writing about the sweatshop, turn me off right there. You know. In, in other, you know, in the, in the, we know about the, the racial problems, we know there's a lot of problems. Why would you leave something comfortable to go in. It makes sense why so many yes. people did live because when you, it's a, When you left Russia yeah. to go to Warsaw, okay, Rovno to go to Warsaw, at that time, at talking. that time Rovno was already, was part of Russia, wasn't it, when you left? No, when we left, we left. In 1920? Yeah, the same day when the, the, the 
Пистрите вас ай. Окей. Ти бе съпортив, не бе, от Русия революция? О, да. Ти бе сказал, че това е отговорен за социалните проблеми и може да се решава. Живи под Тазар не е в терминах на хората. In terms of the the greater society, no democracy under the Tsar, and uh, and you thought there would be under the Soviet regime or under the communist regime. No, the, the communist was too free to say because when the communist regime started, I mean the October Revolution, we saw already that there would not be any freedom, because even with the 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 KGB, what at that time was called the Cheka, what mm -hmm. doesn't matter, predecessor started to the already taking people who don't agree with them, sending to Siberia. And they know they have a lot. Did, did they, you become disillusioned then the, with it? That's where the civil war started. Did you become so, disillusioned at that time with it? I was disillusioned for a long time. Like I was very impressed being in the Second World War, being in the Soviet Union. And they were pressing me to become what's called a candidate. You cannot become a member of the Communist Party till you get a candidate. And I refused flatly, you know, because they didn't know how much I hate them, <laughs> you know. But uh, the only thing I can say about the Soviet Union, it was the miserable, the most miserable time to live there under Stalin. However, I survived there. If I lived under Hitler, I wouldn't be here talking to you. That's, All right, but no, yeah. well, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just your, your, your feelings about the revolution. My were feeling of revolution was positive. And, and before, we, before I find out what the dictatorship means. Okay. All right. You know, very proud of you. You can call me a socialist at that time. Now, Social Democrat, okay? All right. Now, let me ask you this. You're, you're living in Europe. Yeah. It's, it's peace in Europe at that time. In, in a, in well, a well, first of all, you have to late define. 20s, early 30s. Living in Europe, where in Europe? In Warsaw. Okay. You're living in Warsaw in, in the late 20s, early 30s, right? Late 20s, yeah, early 30s, yeah. and it's peace in Europe. It's between yeah. the wars, between World War I and World War II. Hitler comes to power in 1933 in Germany. What impact, if any, did that have on your living, day-to-day -day living in Warsaw? Was scared. To be scared that Hitler will start a war with Poland. And you thought, you already thought that in 33? We, we talk that his program is expansion with the Poland, with the friends of war, that it will be a war. We couldn't guess exactly. But in January 1939... Well, let's go Mr. back now. No, no, let's see the thing. Why we go back? Because Poland lived, in, it was scary, I said, right? Okay. And it was living in scary till 39. In January 39, in Poland at that time, an aggression pact with Germany. In the early 39, the five years an aggression pact expired. So Ribbentrop came to Warsaw uh, to sign, renewed the non aggression pact with Germany. In the same day, the same uh, year, two months later in March, Hitler put an ultimatum to, to Poland to give up the corridor. You know the corridor yeah, also. Yeah. You know, so we know that the war is coming. No, but th now you're talking about 1939. I'm asking you if you had any no, thoughts about no that change. earlier. What, what was the change was also in 1935 in Poland, the change where the government, the Polish government, went uh, quite a little more to the right. Okay, that's what I was kind of w wondering about. be elected about. to, to was this. There, was there, was there, were there more outbreaks of anti-Semitism in Poland after Hitler the took feeling, power? The feeling was that the anti-Semites feel great because they have a Hitler anti-Semite. Have an ally uh, next door. Yeah. You know, we know all about the uh, incidents in, in, in Germany that took place uh, between the time of Hitler's gain of power in 33 and 1939 when he actually began the war. And I'm just going to mention a couple, you know, uh, Kristallnacht, the uh, taking over of Czechoslovakia, the They're annexing of... All the former Polish from there. A lot of the thousands came back to Poland. Okay. Put them on the Polish border. Uh, did you, did, let me ask you this, you know, you're, you're politically astute and you're well read and you've, uh, and you keep up with current affairs. Was there any thought in your mind in in those years between approximately 1933 and 1939, the beginning of the war, where you thought of leaving Poland? 
Oh, just leaving things alone, being comfortable, let me say, being scared of the world start. Okay. So that's, that's, that's about it. And then the time is not waiting for you, the time is going, and the world started, and then it started a new life. <laughs> was life more or less normal for you during uh, these years? It was a uh, little, but kind of an anxiety sets in, because uh, as you mentioned before, uh, anti-Semitism got stronger in Poland. Uh -huh. yeah, and all kind of new rules and stuff like that. It became, uh, so it became a semi-military government kind uh -huh. of, you know, uh -huh. issue. And, uh, and this was not pleasant, you know. In my opinion and opinion of all of my friends, we were uh, saying central left, you know, not, uh, not right. It wasn't a dictatorship, but it was already in order to be elected to the Polish Senate, not the same, the upper house. You had to have a medal from the government, otherwise you couldn't be a candidate, <laughs> something like that. <coughs> so how many Jewish people, Jewish people have medals, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Let's go on for a moment. Now, you, so you've got, you've got a very good job, you're, you're renting an apartment in Poland, in Warsaw, correct? Warsaw you're, Warsaw. you're married, you're married to uh, my mother, That's right. Tanya, and, and now uh, let's go on a little bit. I'm born in 38, December 1938, right. and the war begins, Hitler declares war on Poland in 1939, September old. 1. Yeah, you are nine right? months old, exactly nine now, months. Now, now yes. tell me, just, first of all, was, was the declaration of war by there was no declaration. Well, the the beginning of the war. It okay. was shelling in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. Was it, a, was it was it a shock? Was it a surprise? Oh, are you kidding? You 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 know it seemed like a war was kind of coming. The the the, the secret protocol was Stalin side with Hitler or Ribbentrop with the yes, Molotov. Yes, yes, non-aggression pact. No, but the secret formula was there. They are going to divide Poland. Right. But nobody knew at that time. Right. You know. So, so September 1st, 1939, the Blitzkrieg, as we began, as we later called started it, started. The first day, uh, Friday, the September 1st. Tell, tell, tell me what happened that day. We were living at that time uh, in a, a summer home. It was called Yusef of the, the community. And I used to commute every day by train to work. Okay? Okay. September 1st, I took the last train. It's not the last train, but a few more trains. So I, I, and I went to the office. I didn't have any transportation to go back home, to, you know, to you and Tanya. And then I found out, you know, looking then, there was another railroad, uh, a narrow gate tra gauge, you know. There are tracks, normal tracks, and there were narrow gauge uh, trains, though. So they are going in the direction where I live. So I started out like maybe five o'clock in the afternoon and I arrived like midnight at home. And I said, the first thing we have to do is go back to Warsaw. The war started, you don't see in the southern, in, in Was it like in, a suburb or something of yeah, Warsaw? Yeah, about, about uh, 20 miles, uh, 30 kilometers. Very good, <coughs> very good for you. In the, we were not bound by anything you know, uh, so where in the summer, nobody's living uh, where I lived, you know, where in the house of my, uh, my bosses. And uh, usually, we'd, normally, if the war wouldn't start, you know, we would move for the, for the rest of the year back to Warsaw. So this was a problem to go back to, was, to find some transportation. Transportation, what I mean now, is horse and buggy. I had a car at that time. I bought an Opel car. The reason I bought a car, here yeah, we mentioned it, has to do with anti-Semitism. Because we know already that the central bank of sugar, bank of sugar industry, is taking away the rights of the Jewish representatives representing the sugar fed, the bank, and give it to Gentiles. 
So I said, what, what am I going to do? I'm obsolete in losing a job, being married, I'm a kid. So I decided to buy a car, a used Opel, from a, a chief of the police or something. He was in the business of taxi cabs. Mm -hmm. So he exchanged the <coughs> Opel carrots for Chevrolet's. Mm -hmm. So then I bought it. I, I borrowed, as a matter of fact, $1,000 in order to pay for the car. And I went to professional driver school that the job will end, and I was kind of sure that it will, I'll become a taxi cab, the owner of a taxi cab. So it was a protective device to have an income. It was a protective Protect device, the from, only uh, thing I could think of. I can think of, you know, in the uh, sub of the car. Used to, a friend of mine was driving the taxi, a very close friend of my friend, except for the weekend. For the weekend, we were put in not for hire, you know, in Poly. And we used to enjoy ourselves to go out to the country, you know. So, okay, so now the war starts. Let's go back to that first day. Now the war starts. So the, you, the you, first day I'm stranded for a while. Imagine, to a total chaos in Warsaw on September 1st, 2nd, 3rd. 4th, what? 5th, now you 6th. went and got mother and myself from the sub suburban uh, area that we stayed in yes, and came right. back to Warsaw. That's correct. Where did you stay in Warsaw when you yeah. came back? What am I, where do I stay? You had an apartment in Warsaw also? We ever had an apartment. You, you, you said born. we were staying 20 miles away. Uh, so because of the summer. Oh, summer just house. a summer house. A dacha, you would call it. In I see, Russia. just a cabin or something <laughs> like we call it them just here. A, just a cabin. All right, so now you're back in Warsaw. And, and tell me what you remember about the conversations you were having with your with your co-employees or I friends, what, was, what were you thinking? There were uh, not many, but there was one more besides me, the two sisters were on it. And I start, you know, with my suspicion that I see, in, in, uh, we moved all the way to the offices at that time and not our place. Not because it used to be, he has to do with, he has to do with the States or something, and let's not go into it. All right. And I take it then I got a little suspicion and see they are, they mean my bosses. Uh, looking for transportation to leave uh, Warsaw, go east. And nothing tell me. So he came up and I say, I said, what are you doing? He said, we're going to look, you know, we're going to leave. I said, you're going to leave? What's about me? Just like that. Oh, yes, maybe we'll be able to take you. They didn't even intend. So uh, when I came back home, I told Tanya, they are looking for transportation. If they don't find, if they find something, well, to include us, okay, if not, we take the buggy with the nine months old Arnold and we go east. Within three or four days, you made up your mind to leave Warsaw, is that right? Absolutely. There was a colonel, this colonel, what I mentioned, was on the radio all the time, that all the male population has to leave Warsaw. We organize an army of defense, but leave, the, leave your wives and your children home. And Tanya said, maybe George is right, maybe he's right, you should leave, sir. And I had a simple answer. Tanya, your Arnold doesn't understand yet, you know, still nine months old. We live together or die together. If we decide to stay, we stay together. If we decide to live, we together. Right. So this was solved. And then, while I'm talking to them, I say, why don't you why don't look together? Why don't I get engaged in looking for transportation? He said, it's a good idea. What are, what are you going to do? I say, I'm going to all the stations where trucks are stopping. You know, yeah. there's trucks yeah, stopping. Yeah. Where they sleep and they sleep and everything like that. <coughs> and, see, and find somebody, offer him money, you know, I don't know how much he'll ask. And, uh, and then we'll have transportation to go, to go east. We're there's many Jewish people leaving, leaving Warsaw at that time as, as others. You would never know, this statistic will never be known to me, with how many Jews left and how many, you know. In you know, other words, uh, the, the, every day there was bombing, yes? Yes, three times a day. I mean, airplanes coming over and dropping bombs on the city. The, the message mates, yes. And so, so the, the city is under siege, right? I mean, yeah. the telephones probably aren't working. Uh, yeah. More or less, like 10 percent. I don't know. Okay, and and you you decided this is not the place to be. We got to get out of here. Oh no! Okay. If, if, if my bosses would not go out, 
and even F way out, so you see, but was later uh, occupied by the Germans, they all were killed. Let me ask you this. Obviously, the majority of the population yeah. of Warsaw, I'm assuming, stayed. Is that oh, a fair yes. statement? Yeah, yeah, I have a fair statement. The, the majority. The Jews, was Gentiles, not, it didn't make any difference. The city was not deserted by enemies. When we evacuated from Warsaw, yes. to keep away about the transportation, how? We landed in Rovno. In the time from Rovno with my mother, I decided to go further east to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union came to us. Yeah, I understand. I understand that. But I'm trying to get at why why you were in the minority of those who decided to leave Warsaw. What I, what I, made I, you decide uh, so soon? I didn't say that I was in a minority. Well, we just said that the why, why we have this transportation? The the highways were clogged with people working. They were. Yeah, certainly. So people were suddenly refugees overnight. Now let me ask you. Let me ask you some practical questions yeah. under those circumstances. You obviously have bank accounts, you know, uh, somewhere uh, personal bank accounts. Okay. Uh, you didn't keep all your money in a mattress, I don't presume. Yeah. You had an apartment with furniture and furnishings and clothing, like most people normally live. You drop that immediately. I mean, you just we, forget we, about we, it. Because that's right. We do. Oh, well, me. Uh, what do you do? How do you act in chaos? I don't know. I'm asking yeah, you. you. I've, know, never, I've not been in that situation. The, the, you, don't mean, you don't even try to go to the bank. And we didn't have money in the bank. Wait, wait, so wait. you leave Warsaw, you arrange for transportation, right? Yeah, and this is an interesting story, but we might not go into it. But it was not easy to find a truck for 3,000 zlotys. And I find the truck is the owner and the driver of the truck. is with his family on the station where he keeps them. In he evacuated from Lava, what Lava is the name of a city, what, he, he, what is on the German border, he cannot go back to Lava, he doesn't go back to Germany. So my pitch to him was, you are a refugee already. Your home is in Lava and you left everything. Why not take us? It will pay you well. Mm -hmm. You know. And, uh, and the wife, uh, as I told you, with the family, and the wife came in and talked about it. She said, no, maybe we'll stay here. We don't know. She feels kind of, uh, you know, she doesn't feel right that we should go because she says, my husband has tuberculosis. And I don't like him to something that happened on the road. You have no help. Maybe in the in Warsaw, no matter who comes, German will get some help, you know. And I told her, we're still passing cities and if we need help. Anyway, he agreed. Now the truck I found, there I walk in the station, and there's the body of the truck, but no wheels. Because the police went from station to station and confiscated private trucks. So uh, they took the wheels off? The, they were, the, the wheels were Very so clever. hidden that the police couldn't find the wheels here. You know, and they say, we have to do it at night. And we do it at night, it was pitch night. And it's a blackout in the city, so it really pitch black, you know. And uh, we finally wind up with 48 people. On the know, truck. truck? On an open bed truck? An open bed, an eight ton truck. With, with sight. You know. Where did the other people we come from? Where did the other people come from? Friends and relatives. Of the Raiders? Raiders. While on the track, and I sit on the top because they were loading up with a lot of things, and there was yeah, an episode, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you sometime. Uh, we cro we got in the street, and a wire crossed the street and hit me to the temple, and I fell down right to the pavement. The Raiders were wealthy people, weren't they, by, oh, yeah. sta by those standards? Millionaires. Millionaires. How did they take, did they take any of their wealth with them when oh, they left? The, 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 the wealth, all of what you can carry, all of what they have in the suitcases. No, but I mean what? Currency, jewelry, oh, they, they, what, they, what, they, how do you carry wealth? They, they are buildings How do you in carry Italy? millions? You, 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 carry, you carry jewelry and gold and diamonds. When did they have the time to convert their wealth to things that they could take along? What do you mean? They were buying it all the time. I see. They say European thing like that anyway. In other words, that was a custom in yeah, those days. Not had, like in our yeah, in our day, we have he, bank he, accounts. He, they he had, had the real commodities. In Italy, and, and if he has uh, money in a Swiss bank, he had a certificate. I but, see. You know. I see. So now, you leave Warsaw. Describe the trip 
from Warsaw to back to Rovno, which is going east, right? Right. And then which, it which took us to Kovel. And is, which at that point Russia. became part of Russia because of the non-aggression pact. Rovno was now uh, again non, Russia. Not non, the non-aggression pact. But the non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin in, in the, the the secret protocol to give up half of the right. country so, to divide so Poland. So Poland was divided in half. You yeah. merely went to the eastern half of Poland, where Rovno was and your family, correct? Yeah, my mother. Yeah. And to, how far? How many miles are we speaking about from Rovno to Warsaw? Well, we are speaking about 300 miles, close to 300. 300 miles. Because we didn't teach Rovno for Warsaw. It took us another 12 days to come there. Okay. So we made to Kowel about 250 miles. The other 100 miles we made on a horse and buggy. We were working with him. Finally, we arrived in. And Rovno. Uh, the 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 16th, the 17th of September. Uh, on the trip from Warsaw now, with the 48 people on the truck. I presume everyone maybe had a suitcase or two at the most? It's a story in itself. All the people, the mostly rich people, try to get as much as they can with them. You come with two, three, four, five suitcases. There was no way to put in luggage of 48 people. I came with two suitcases. I and at a point you say, we can make it. I say, we are in danger, and it was a danger, that if they bomb the bridges, no way you can go. You have to cross the river in order to go east. Mm -hmm. still, uh, let's hurry up. And what, what, what do you suggest, they say? I suggest we leave a lot of the luggage here, whether we can do it, take the best, the things which you think you'll need more, or something like that. And I was so uh, mad that we, we might not make the trip because of this, uh, the luggage. I went, climbed up on the truck, and I picked up my suitcase, one of my two suitcases, it was three, it never came to. And I say, we should dump our luggage. What about doing right here, you know what we have, and everybody's got running around like kids, you know. I say, you have five buildings, we'll go to your closet building, what you still own, you know, you never know, you might haunt after a while, you will dump it there. And eventually, if we'll be alive, we will come back sometime and get it. And as an example, I took my suitcase overhead and boom, right there from the truck. So a guy, a guy actually is uh, one of the, my boss's uh, daughter's uh, husband. Hey, Joe, the communists are not here yet. You know, you say, all of a sudden, communists. Yeah. Whether well, you are a communist or whatever it is, I say, if you if you live, you'll, you'll get back or whatever it is. If you risk your life by taking another suitcase, we'll never make it. And some people, you know, some people Russia say, you know, it's just right, just right. We dump. Plenty of suitcases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You better to spoil the buildings they own. You come back and they will start loading. Then a little young girl, you know, from Russia, Ukrainian, a poor girl, what used to work in Warsaw for the Raiders because he came from yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the you know, living, she has a little, little, little suitcase like this and start climbing uh, on the truck. So some guy who knows that she's just a maid. Eat her over the hand and say, you're not here, this is not for you. Oh, you should see me furious. I say, take your suitcase and come back, I'll put it. You sit down and be on the track, don't move, no matter who wants to move. And I tell the guy, you know, she's so young. He left her family, a mother or father or something like that. And she's all alone, nobody cares. Would you leave her alone? Yeah. Right, so you, you, uh, you, you, you're on the truck now and you're heading back toward the east. Any other incidents uh, that, that occurred? Uh, were so far, none. I relaxed when we crossed the bridge and I told you the incident that a wire hit me the temple yeah, and I fell yeah. down. So I recovered and I came back. So I didn't go up again. This truck, as I told you, it's an 80 ton, big, uh, eight yeah, ton uh, yeah. big truck. It, Wide fenders like that, even they are curved. Yeah. I lied down on the fender. In the rest of the of the trip, I was making on the fender. The only thing it was not comfortable. I'm not speaking of that. 
was that hot water from the radiator was dripping on my head. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Germans didn't bomb the truck or the roads or... Uh... They, they were bombing, but they, 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 not the places where we were. And you... then uh, we came to a city only close, 100 miles from Warsaw, yeah. ran out of uh, gasoline. Now you wind up back in Rovno, right? Eventually. Three o'clock in the morning. And, and you spend the next, what, a year and a half approximately in Rovno? 19 months. 19 months, so that's a year that's and a half. September 39 to June 22nd, yeah. 41. Okay, and historically, uh, Hitler uh, violates the non-aggression pact in June of 1941, right? That's correct. And proceeds to invade the Soviet Union, be beginning the war against the Soviet two, Union. Two days he took over. So, so now you're on the move again. Absolutely. Okay. Now, on the move on, not far from the Soviet border. All right. So my aim is the Soviet Union. Right. Now, now you have to go how far to get to the Soviet Union? Uh, to, to 20 miles what's or the, the What's 20. the safest place at oh, that 20 point? 20 kilometers, I decided That's to walk. All. I didn't even look for transportation. You walked? To walk to, to Ostrog was right on the border. And, and somehow, the, uh, the question in our mind was, would the Soviet let us in? Let me ask you something. Uh, when you went back to Rovno, your mother was still alive. We left her. Your sisters were alive. You had two we sisters? We left her, yeah. Two sisters. Two sisters. We left the two And your mother. And who else? Mother's cousin. And a mother's cousin. Four. Mm -hmm. Four women. Yes, right. Right? In, 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 in a husband of one of my oldest sisters. I see. And they were going to stay there, uh, hoping to yeah, survive the to war. Stay. I intended to take everybody, but my mother would have died the first time on the track. She was ill. She was paralyzed. Uh-huh. Right side. I see. You have to lift up. So my cousin, my, my mother's cousin, said, you have to leave at least one of the sisters. Otherwise, if you take them both, I'm going to quit too. Because I cannot... Did you leave? You, you say you walked out of Rovno at that point in 1941 when, uh, when Hitler started no, coming I, east? I worked in, an, in a place with... No, we walk, we were in the truck business. Out? We didn't know. We, uh, listen, you don't understand the answer. I work in a place where there was the truck business. Uh -huh. We have 20 trucks. So the manager of the outfit told me, Joe, you can do whatever you want. You can go home, never shut up. It's a war and we don't care. However, if you want to work it, I'll give you to your disposal a truck. I so see. that's why I could take my sisters, my mother. Uh, my mother I couldn't take because of the mother, not because of transportation. Yeah, you were about 35 years old it at this point. It's interesting. The episode is interesting because a few months before I changed the job because I had to change. The KGB is after me. So a Russian, a Russian, a Russian accountant, the head accountant, um, advised me to quit the job. But you cannot quit. He will write to the manager. The managers. So this is the quartermaster of the Russian Fifth Army. Mm -hmm. You know, so he find, and he was a very old Russian intelligent, and he said they have a problem because they'll be, they say they'll be after you, they'll be after you. However, it'll be better if you change the job. So that's what you did. So, not not wow. easy, so they don't let me go. So, so he find a loophole that they reduce my salary. Uh, you can quit if the salary reduced. Otherwise, you cannot quit. Let me ask you something. As, you, as, you're, as you're running now from, from, from Hitler, from the German forces. Second time. Yeah. Uh, what's, your, what's your first stop after Rovno? The, well, uh, you stayed for any the length of time. The first stop, as a matter of fact, was Novograd, was in the city where I Back was born. Back to where you were born. But, but you didn't stay there very for now, long. For now, Zhutomir is a big city in Kiev. Who's driving the truck? You got a driver? Were you driving the truck? Do I, do my disposal uh, is a truck yeah. with a, with so a you, driver. So you're driving the truck? No. You got a driver. The, the, driver's, the driver's driving his own truck, what he drove yesterday. I see. And, uh, Except it's a vacation road. Matter of fact, the, as a matter of fact, they have to be, but this is, you know, not important. The, the manager of the whole outfit was a Jew that I met later right, but, but in Israel. How far did you get then? When, 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 when's the first city that you now are Kiev, staying in? Kiev. You go to Kiev. Not the first, the first and the last. We made Kiev, 
Okay, and that's how far care. from uh, Rovno? 200 about miles? 200 miles. So now you're in Kiev. In a theater, in a movie theater. You have no home. No. You have a suitcase or two. You step on the chairs. And, and that's it. In a theater. In a movie theater. Three weeks. In a movie theater. How long did you stay in Kiev? Three weeks. Just three weeks? Yeah. Only three weeks? They were already almost, almost in Kiev. You Kiev. mean the, the German army was almost in Kiev. So now you've got to go beyond, right? Not out of water. Okay, where, where do you, how do you get out of Kiev? Train? There was, yes. And the train was for wives and children of people working for the KGB or NKVD at that time. Right, it. right. You know. Now the outfit I worked before. Well, not how did you the, get on the train? Because I worked before for the... For the quartermaster, quarter you know. I see. So now, where does that train? I mean, the company I went to the train. In the new job, the new job was important. Even it was not a, a KGB outfit, but it was under jurisdiction of the KGB because the new outfit where I work is uh, was building roads by prisoners, Polish officers. They had no business. 11,000 of them had got killed in Katyn. You heard about it, Katyn Falls. Sure. Yeah. But uh, look, look, uh, where, where does this train take you? Where does know. this train go? The train, the, the guy, the head of the train, a colonel in the army, an NQD colonel, not just a colonel. Yeah. It means we're going from car to car. We're going to take you east as far as we can, and we'll unload you, and the first city will accept us. We will stop for places that we can feed you. And I and my friend were the only man, male, okay, on the train. Otherwise, it was 100% families of K women and children, uh, workers of K Canada. Uh, okay, so now the train, the train stops, where do, where's your next stop? The train stop, I can't remember all the small no, towns No, no, I mean, where did you finally settle? It will make it, it, will make it like for that. For any length of time. It took 10 days and 10 nights to, uh, finally, Chilabi says, yes, we can take in refugees. Okay, which is a city uh, in What's in, in the, the Ural Mountains, uh, it's western Siberia, it's start, okay. the start of Siberia. Okay. It's right at the Euro Mountains in Siberia. Was this a passenger train or a freight train? The train itself was not box cars. It okay, was a pass passenger train. Yeah, yeah, for women and children. So how long were you in, Sh in Shelyabinsk? We were unloaded at a sports stadium. Yeah. August 11th. And there were already snow flurries. <laughs> yeah, but unloaded there. I start looking and some people in charge of the train start looking and helping us to get located, to go get a roof on it. Yeah. Like so they find us a room, and we unloaded with Russian people. How long did you stay there? So well, well, the next day, the things to do is we're going to stay in Chilabinsk. We have to look for a job. So we went from office to office, and they were desperate for people. Mobilization to the war was up to 55 years. If you're a Soviet citizen, you're 55, you go to the army. So they didn't have anybody to work in a country for them. They were so glad. They showed us that we left enough to eat. They invited us. It was called the zootechnic, the guy in charge of the kettle. It's a kettle soft horse, not a cold horse. A soft horse, and it's a big difference. A soft horse is like an office, uh, any industry. A coal horse is a cooperative where you are an owner. A farm. A far yeah, it's the soft horse also manage farms. Yeah, I understand. We have, so we, in the said, you know, it's time to eat and to show off, and there was uh, bread and butter and eggs, uh, you name it. Uh, not any was an American breakfast, okay? So we say, we'll take it. And we were three accountants, three meals. How long did you stay there? In the city. Till the time we stayed there till December 10th. December of 1930, 40. No, 41, yeah, 1941. 41. Okay. Why did you leave there? Because most of the Polish refugees, and we have some contacts, decided to go south, that you can go to Tehran, to Afghanistan, 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. To all, all the places where right on the border, southern border, uh -huh. not far from India uh -huh. and something like that. In Siberia, they say, we'll, we'll stay in eventually, knowing the way the Soviets are working. We'll stay until we die. We have, we have no, uh, no place to go and where yeah. to go. Yeah. And because the majority are going there, we decide also to go there. And there where was south? A, south to where? What was the destination? Central Asia. So, so five republic. Uh, you, you didn't have to leave at that point. You decided that, that was a way of getting Never out of the Soviet Union. It was difficult to get tickets. They didn't want to leave. They didn't no, I understand that. But you didn't have to leave because of the threat of the Germans coming. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, I was dreaming at that time. Say in Chelyabinsk, and then we went to Nova Pierce, further east to go to go south. That if the war continues, you know, and the Germans are maybe not so successful. But the Japanese are at that war too. In, in the, in, and I was dreaming that the Japanese will come, probably better to live under the Japanese than to live under Hitler. You know, because yeah. nobody knew, everybody said Hitler will go past the Euromont, Hitler will go to Siberia. Were you uh, ever, after leaving Rovno, threatened by Hitler again? No. Never? Too far. It was too far. Okay. Hitler was too far. So west. you got, how far south did you get? What was the... Uh, the first uh, stop, kind of, or the, or the train went further, was Almaty, what is the capital of Kazakhstan, right on the Chinese border. Mm -hmm. Then it starts going west. Are you in a group Tashkent. of people at this point? Our group. The Polish immigrants? No. Or refugees? No, just our. All right, we start in Siberia because in order to go from Chelyabinsk, to go south, there is no road from Chelyabinsk. Uh -huh. You have to go another 1,300 miles yeah. to Novosibirsk, what's one of the biggest cities. Right. In Novosibirsk, goes south. Train, goes train south. Okay. So Almaty is the first. Uh, where did you settle for the duration of the war? Oh, we went to Katakurgan, was the name of the city, because some friends from Rovno something were living there. Where is so that? Good where, to what, come. what province is that in? It's, uh, it's 50 miles from Samarkand. I mean, is that, is, that, is that Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan? No, no, it's Uzbekistan. It's Uzbekistan. Katakurgan. Right. And uh, spent, spent the duration, the, the remainder of the war there? No, no, no. Then, uh, then the mobilized in the army, and I ran out from the train. And after I ran from the train, I knew where mommy, where mommy was. And so I started working in Kyrgyzstan. And the reason I ran down from the train there, because I had a friend there. It's, uh, it's an old story. It takes longer than... Where did you... But, but what I'm getting at is, where did you finally stay during the duration of the war till it ended? In, in certain places, like I come from Uzbekistan, I ran out from the train. I went to a city by the name of Osh. Again, a friend. I say, any friend would let you in to go and sleep overnight. You know, it becomes like getting a job and what are you doing? Well, why, why the running? Now, you're not under the threat of Germany anymore. Why the bouncing I around from I know one that city to when they, when, when they uh, uh, enlist me, enrolled in, in the army. Well, you were avoiding the Russian army. I wouldn't move if they would not, certainly the Russian army. And I know the train is going back to Siberia. And I decided I'd rather die and I'd go back to Siberia, period. Mm -hmm. So I ran away the train at midnight with a, with a fellow 19 uh, years old and he was in a way a detriment because he had diarrhea or something and uh, he was afraid. When I make up my mind, you know, I'm very serious, I do it no matter what will happen. I cannot predict <coughs> what will happen. Didn't you and we had, we had false documents too. Didn't, didn't you spend a good yeah, deal yeah. of time in some of these cities though, like nine, nine months, six months, a year? Uh, in in uh, Central Asia? All right, in Central Asia, the reason for changing a turn was because they investigated our finances and we got clean. I, as a head accountant, would go five years in jail. My books were locked under the lock. I couldn't, I, I came yeah. to the office, I couldn't even work. And they got two, two accountants from the bank, a woman and a man, and they read a protocol they've never seen anywhere such well kept books. No, but what was, the, what was the problem there that they the were... The problem was there was a guy, they know that we are selling, so to speak, quotation mark, selling, 
you know, telling that we got a, a, a cow from them, and it's all go not by meat, it goes by livestock. And we are selling it and we pocket the money, but it was see. true. I see. Daddy, you know, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, interesting incidents occur to you uh, during those years during the war when you were moving from one place to another. I remember uh, once you mentioned, and maybe you can elaborate on uh, the time that uh, the uh, predecessor to the KGB, the NKVD, uh, arrested you. What were, what, what were the circumstances? Uh, it, it, at that time, uh, we already changed our document. Changes, it's another story. If you come to it, I'll tell you why. So I went to the rail station, not far from the rail station, was uh, a cotton gin, when you convert cotton into oil, you know, so like that. And there was an accountant, and I know he's looking for also g buying mm -hmm. a passport. Usually the new documents were documents of Jewish people dying in the camp, call them concentration camp, call them whatever you want, dying in the camp. The reason for that was because in my old document, it was that I was born in uh, Novograd Volinsk. What it means that uh, this belongs to the Soviet Union. So we thought if we keep these old documents, we'll never go back home because they'll say you are a Soviet citizen and that's it. So a lot of people, majority, in the, we are the same Soviet uh, identification card is what we have, mm -hmm. is try to buy it. And there was a market on that. I have a friend, the Minsis, I don't know if you know, probably told you sometime, that he was dealing kind of in that. But I say I don't want to know anything, uh, everything about. We did our own documents, but I don't want to, to be in the business of uh, that. Persuaded me that this one time I should go in and as accountant and see whether it's interesting. So I went there, and it's next to the rail station, and there are lugs, you know, cutting into the rail station. In, in the distance from there, what I didn't even notice, was a woman, a woman guard with a rifle. So two guys walking by, and I was sitting on the, on, on the lug, eating an ivra. It's a, uh, it's a Central Asian apple, you know, uh, and waiting till the accountant will arrive because it was not time, it was lunch time or something like that. And they stopped and they say, what are you doing here? I said, uh, I came here applying to apply for a job in the cotton gin uh, as, a, as an accountant, another accountant, so he's not there now. So I'm waiting for him. I say, you know that this is a military object, the, the logs and everything in this area, and you cannot be here. I said, no, I didn't know, you know, excuse me, get up and want to go. I said, you don't go anywhere. You see, you were with us, in two plain clothes, not, not uniform police. And we went to the street, it's not far, and he starts stopping, you know, trucks, he stopped the truck, identified to the drivers or something. And uh, when we were walking, one walks in front, the other in the back, you know. And she climbed on the truck, and I climbed the truck, and it took me right to the militia. Across the street from the militia was the political branch, what I would call from NKVD. Before it was, the KGB was a branch on NKVD, but mm -hmm. I was arrested by the political, in the political, uh, office of the NKVD. But first he put me in a cell in the militia. The militia, there's a room for the detainees, whether they send from there to a camp or to jail, or they let you go. So finally, they called my name, and uh, naturally they, they take you on. I had in my pocket this, the documents, what uh, my friend gave me to hold mm -hmm. and, and also talk 
to the accountant whether you'd like to buy one. And uh, we came to the militia, the guy is coming in, uh, told me to sit down, you cannot stand. And I, because I say, oh, thank you. You don't say thank you. you. Sit down, you mean sit down. Sit down, he goes to the, all the documents, he say, what are this? And I said, those are documents of people who died in the camps. And uh, there are some people, the one I have the documents, I know them. So I talked eventually the war will end. And we will find their relatives, parents, or something, and tell them the story. You'll and get the the documents. Documents. So he said, You know something of Russian literature? I say, Yes, something. And I pretend that I'm Polish. You know. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you say, Yes. Did you read Gogol? Yeah, you know something about Gogol, but I don't know what you're referring. Gogol wrote something about a, land, a landlord who collected the documents of uh, dead serfs. And they announced that he can sell 5,000 serfs because they had the documents. No people, the people were, yeah, were there. Yeah. I say, so he tells me the story. About, Are you like this guy where the hero was Chichikov in Plushkin? To heal. <clears throat> so I pretend to say, you know, I did never read that something. And I, I knew it. So, yeah. yeah. So I finished, he looked, he looked, looked, he looked, right up, whatever he right up, he said, You come with me. Come with me, put me in a cell with the militias, you know. So. Not long from them, I was called, uh, the, called the name, he said, Come with me. A guy, a policeman with his gun out, you know, and it's across the street. And I know there was a sign, this is the anchor, the political delay. While we were sitting in this cell, there's about 30 people, mostly Uzbeks, for all kinds of reasons, late to work, not showing up, you know, whatever their, their mm -hmm. crime was. And it's just a cell with a drum, that's all, no chair, no, nothing. And a cement floor, and you never seen so many lights crawling under the one place. You know, with the, and you wait, it, there are some other details, but I maybe skip. I'll go out when they called me my name. They called me and I came across the, the street and I walk into there and there's uh, two guys sitting there. Uh, it's like an L, you know, uh, the one, uh, one desk is like this and the other makes like an L on angle. To her. And then so I sit in a chair because he, he, he ordered me to sit down. And uh, he keep on telling me that I am spying. I, I'm accused of spying for the Polish government. Yeah, they say we don't have, uh, this country doesn't have any relation with the Polish government in London. I have no money, you know, I'm looking for my wife, my wife and child. We were separated after we were in the camp and, and, uh, and looking, I was told she is, is somebody saw in this area. Uh -huh. So I say, you are lying. So he hits with his fist on the desk, you are lying. And he keeps on saying, and in the meantime, the other guy walks out from the room. The guy who remained in the and interrogated me, say, you know, I'll tell you something. We have a lot of material on you. And he shows with his hands like a stack. And a, so we have everything. If you are, if you'll admit, you know, that you are spying, because you're admitting, your sentence will be lighter. If not, it's a very serious. Uh, problem, you have a very serious problem. And I keep on denying, you know, and I say, uh, repeat again what I said. And uh, he said, okay, we finished. Whatever you wrote, I didn't sign, didn't say anything. And uh, we're again on our policeman with the gun out and almost could feel in the back, the touching uh, across the street. So I said, uh, Comrade militiaman, you know, where the comrade. So stops me right there. Because you're under arrest, you cannot call me comrade. You call me citizen policeman. 
So I said, I'm sorry, I never was arrested citizen policeman. And, uh, you know, I'm more than 24 hours here, and I didn't get even my rich of my bread, you know, 400 grams of bread. He said, no, it's impossible. We feed all, all the prisoners. They will find out. He gets in, he goes to the guy, he keeps the books, and he calls my name. Did he get his, his bread? His ration, whatever. They call it. He looked, he looked, he says, no. The reason is because they brought them 11.30 and we distributed the food at 11. Same 24 hours for, without food. Okay. By the way, when they booked me in the cell, they took away my belt in shoelaces mm -hmm. to prevent suicide. Water. Sure. I don't know. You rested, okay. Yeah. And there's all kind of episodes that uh, may be interesting. Well, what was the outcome of this? The, yeah, I'm going to the outcome. So it's another day, another night, next day, call me again. How many days were you there now? Four, the, the, four, four days? The, together, uh, four to eight hours. Okay. And nothing happened. <clears throat> the the, the incubator doesn't call me anymore. But the guy in charge of the cell calls my name. And he said, take your stuff, what you, if you have, whatever you have with you, and go home. Just like that. So I was afraid to stop to give me back my belt and my shoelaces. Just afraid that they might change their mind or something. <clears throat> and I was running to the friend that I'm staying with. And it, it's kind of, you know, I wonder later, that they seen somebody running like that way, I should have been arrested again, you know. What is yeah. he running? Yeah. He came home and I said, all right, we'll see something, I'll take care of it. You cannot buy a belt anywhere in the holding. So he knew the chief of the police, the, the militia, not, not the... Yeah, area. yeah. So he went to him and they gave it to him. I see. Know. So I got back my license and my... Uh, when went. did the war in Europe come to an end? 1945? Yeah, May 8, 1945. May 8, 1945. In Russia, May 9, because the term at the time, you know, yeah, time really. Yeah, Where were you at that time? In Molotovabad. Well, the city was Kazilki, yeah. Uh -huh. This is Kyrgyzstan. Okay. And it was, uh, the, the, all the jobs I have, this was the best. Also not honest, you cannot be You honest. were always an accountant, weren't you, of some kind? I had in, all, in all of these, I had in all of these situations. That's correct. Uh, I even stole new systems. <laughs> <laughs> system. So you're in Kyrgyzstan and the war is over. You hear that the war is over, yeah. right? How do I hear it? How do I hear the war is over? Yeah. We had the radio, it was the, they confiscated all the radios. But on the upper corner, under the ceiling, a loudspeaker. in the room, the loudspeaker, what they give you instead. Yeah. The storage. So the loudspeaker announced it about 3, 30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. So I dressed up and I worked out and knocked to the neighbors. I said, you, you, you pardon me, but you have to get up the walls up. <laughs> okay. Now tell me, uh, what are your thoughts at that point? Well, where, where, you know, what, what goes on in your mind when you've been running now for, well, the war started in September of 1940. 39, it's now yeah. almost six years later. Yeah, it's, it's almost six years. Yeah. Uh, that, you, that you've been uh, running in different That's cities right. and not, not having any steady employment, uh, struggling. What, what, what do you think about when you say, well, geez, I the war is I over? I knew already there's nothing to come words that everybody's dead, that I know. You knew that? Uh, yeah. From rumors, I newspaper a, accounts? No, I wrote a postcard to the mayor of Romno in the same mayor was before the war came back. In Shirodne Poskaz, that are the old population, Jewish population in Rovno, only 13 people left. Okay, so you knew your mother and your sisters were killed by the oh, Nazis. Well, there's nobody to go to. Yeah. Uh, and at that time, I would say, the America came to my mind, you know. Although I, I used it before once too, when we were evacuated the second time, when Hitler got to started the war, you know, against the Soviet Union. There was a neighbor, who was a journalist. Yeah. And he saw that I'm packing to leave Rovno to go east. He said, you are crazy. You saw uh, the life under the Bolshevik. It couldn't be any worse than a German. 
in my answer used to be, I will be a record run from Hitler in my underwear. You know, in the same thing then the United States came to my mind. You know, the few years yeah. later what yeah. I, well, yeah. I'm talking, uh, the question with the yeah. war, war ended. And I also ask questions. Oh, it will become normal life, the war is over, it's not like that. And my answer used to be, up till now, and I'm not young anymore, in my opinion, up till now, I lived in the Eastern Hemisphere. I'd like to read the second... Uh, All right, so uh, you thought about coming to the United States at that point, right? The only way. Uh, where did you go immediately from Kyrgyzstan? Yeah, to Lodz. You went back to Lodz, yeah, Poland. Yeah, we were staying in trains, and I naturally allowed well, to Well, why to Lodz? I mean, Lodz wasn't even in the picture no, all your Lodge life. Lodz was in the picture because Lodz was not uh, bombarded as well. So Warsaw was 70% destroyed. I see. So there was nothing to go back yeah, there to. I would go back to Warsaw if I worked for the Polish government. That's all. Or on the black market or something. All right, so you, you go to Lodz, and uh, my sister was born in Lodz in 1945. No, 20, 1945. In a uh, how long did you spend in Lodz at the time? Till April 46. So about uh, nine Johnny months? was five months old. And we left to Germany. Okay. To now you, you went from Poland, from Lodz. How were you living during that time? How did, how did you eat? There were the bread and then when the Passover came and there was a, 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 a scare because, uh, you know, in the market the women were running that Jews are killing again Christian boys to bake matzahs, but they couldn't say to bake matzah because the matzah came from the United States, from the Jewish yeah. people. So they say the, just a, a Christian boy was killed, 11 years old, 12 years old, and they used his blood to make sausages. It was 1945. I, oh, I would give to the paper. People don't believe that. So then it, there, was, there was still four papers there, including the communists. There was not a pure communist like that. So but the, how were you eating? My question was, how do you? Where do you, Where's your income coming a from? A job, right away, a job. But the job, the the, the Soviet job, or the Polish job, I should yeah, say. Yeah. Still, the work, it works now like semi-communist government did not provide enough. So we used to get from the United States, from Uncle Isaac, like $100. And how do you get $100? There's no, no play. I work for people, happen to be Jewish people, with a cooperative in the textile business. He has a relative, or his wife, lived in Stockholm, mm -hmm. you know. And he had money, you know, dollars in Lodge. So I got $100 from him. I understand. And Isaac sent $100 to Stockholm. Uh-huh. So this helped. Now, then you left... In, in, the, in the Jewish committee. Helped. Then you left, you left uh, there was an immigration committee Poland for immigrants, let refugees. You out. No, no, Poland closed the borders out. You couldn't leave Poland. Ah. So then comes a very, I call it... Why would you do that? Just, why? Why would Poland close its borders so that you can't leave I, Poland? I don't know. They didn't want public commotions on the border. They didn't want the whole thing. They closed the border. Nobody can leave the country. How did you uh, get to Germany if Poland had, cro had closed its borders? Yeah, that is the question. So it comes an organization, or already exists organization, from Israel by the name of Bricha, an underground organization with one reason, one purpose, to organize Jewish people to leave Poland for Israel. And we signed up. I did sign up there, uh, René later. And good at René, because my booking was on the Exodus. When, uh, so would, uh, how do they do it? Bribed Soviet trucks. Just plain the driver or somebody in charge of the driver. With money, cigarettes, whatever they had. To smuggle on the border. So we, the smuggling of the border from Lodz to Berlin was one of the worst uh, times, you know. You were all the time sick on the, on the track. You, did, you didn't stop vomiting on the track all the time. You were pale and So you, you smuggled yourselves out of Poland By Bricha. to Germany, That's to a, a DP camp, if I'm not mistaken. To the American DP camp. 
this, this place person is in Schlachtensee. I'm right in the picture. In where? Schlachtensee. Not far from Berlin. It's a transit camp. Where was Einring? Einring was, Einring is, was like four miles from Salzburg. From the Austrian border. But so you were, in a, you were in a displaced persons camp at that point. Yeah, we Who were ran that camp? The joint, the joint uh, the, uh, the committee? The UNRA. You know what they are. They were running the camp. In, I see. In, 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 in uh, Jewish hoodlums were running the camp. They were, we were. Because it was transit camp. They were stealing it blindly. They, a lot of them were arrested. I see. I see. Yeah. So now we're now we're coming to uh, now 1946. In, in, now we are 1946 in NDP camp at the end of February, uh, April, and we sit in a we live in a rat infested barrack. I mean the rats were running over my my blanket. <laughs> I'm not kidding. As a matter of fact, a week or two later, when we were a lot of them complaining, they have to. This disinfect the, the barracks. Yeah. So we moved out for a night, and it was warm, it was summer, you know, and it stopped kind of for a while. And then, so what do they do for the camp? They came to me to take this, and I refused. I'm curious, why did you decide not to go to Israel? I see, very simple. I risked the life of my children when I, too many times. I'm not going to risk him again to, to break the British blockade. We wouldn't come to Israel anyway. We'd wind up in Cyprus. That's right. You know, so I did nothing like that, no matter how good and bad it is. I'm not going to. And at that time, I had a visa, more or less at that same time, to go to Brazil. So I'm registered to go to Brazil. There's no Brazilian consul in uh, Munich, but the Swedish consulate was handling this type of deals. So I went there, I said, you have a visa. And in order to go and pick up your visa, we don't deal with the Swedish consulate. Don't, don't deal with the, uh, Brazil directly, something like that. And the visa came to Switzerland. We have no connection with Switzerland either, as far as this type of uh, job. Mm -hmm. What we'll do, we'll write to the consul, to the Brazilian consul, Sweden, to send your papers to Paris. Ah. And we'll try to get you a passage to Paris. Mm -hmm. So we're going to Paris. <laughs> so that's how you wound up in Paris. That's how we wound up in Paris. Now, for 11 months. 11 months living in, uh, in Paris, France. Why did it take 11 months? Was well, 10 or 11. Why did it take formalities, formalities, formalities? Just, just red tape. We were we red tape in New Zealand. And, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm wrong because I tell you why. When we came to Paris, the first, my first trip was to the uh, uh, Brazilian consulate in Paris. When I came to Paris, I said, your visas cancel all the visas with no exceptions. In I, as a consul, used to have the right to give the visas. No more. You can go to Brazil only if uh, uh, the, the Brazilian government allows you to go. So I walked out. That's why I was stranded in Paris. So in Paris, when I walked out, there was a guy who, who regularly is traffic in the, in the embassy there. And he stopped me and said, you, uh, where are you going or something? He said, a visit to Brazil. Oh, no. He knew. The old was uh, forget about it. Brazilian uh, government didn't like because the, the Jewish immigrant from Eastern Europe came. They start right away black market or something. And they need uh, farmers or peasants in clergymen they could go. So this guy tell me, for $300, I'll make you papers, your, your choice. You can go as a Polish uh, priest, a Catholic priest, I said to say, or as a farmer. And I say, no, no, but thank you. Thank you, no. So that's why I was stranded. So uh, how, did the, how did the visa to the United States come up? How did you, have, how did you wind up? And uh, Nicola start, started to try to get a visa to the United States. She was already living in Should New York. Should I see anything the way I came? Yeah, uh, sure. Are you, are you, are you, uh, so we're sitting, we're sitting in uh, 
in Paris, in a hotel, hotel Mirabeau, all the family. For the summer, they decided, it naturally belongs to the Joint Distribution Committee in America. For the summer, they decided to take the family, like we did with two kids, yeah. to Chateau du Bac, which was 45 kilometers, 30 miles from Paris, where you learn how to swim. We have a French instructor yeah. there. Yeah. And so we lived there, and then we started getting documents. And she went to a yeshiva, and they hired me as a rabbi. In the United States, as this opened. It's otherwise, the other way to go to America, I had to go back to the P camp. Because the moment I left the P camp and came to Paris, I lost the P camp status. Mm -hmm. I'm not a stateless anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, you know, it's a catch funny too. And uh, finally, this materialized. And uh, the agent drilled me on the boat, <laughs> really gave me, gave me a two degree. So you came over as a rabbi. That's correct. Instant rabbi. You should do that. Oh, I never w w hired uh, for the yeshiva, so I'm kind of like a teacher, you can say, but the official name is rabbi. In order to be a teacher in the yeshiva, you have to be a rabbi. So uh, in 1947, <clears throat> August 1947, that you arrived in New York? No, we arrived in New York. Let, let me see, you know, I forget the exact date. I think it was 1947. But was not the August. Yeah. No? No. November 11, November 11, the job. Go back, go back two months. In November 11, 47, I got the, the job. We came in uh, the beginning of November. Uh-huh. No, November, beginning of October. You, you didn't, October 5th, we were in St. Yeah. Paul. You didn't stay in New York very long. Yeah. Uh, you came to St. Paul uh, because you had a sister here. That's and uh, got a job with uh, the William Harris Woolen Company yeah. uh, for right. 90 cents an hour as a, like, right. as a bookkeeper. That's right. Started out with them, and a uh, year and a um, half ago, uh, you uh, were still years. with them. Same family, the same... Uh, 44, almost 45 years, 44 years. Describe what uh, life was like for you when you arrived in St. Paul in 1947. We moved into Dentien. Moved in with your sister? Yeah. And how long did you live there? A couple months? Several weeks, no. Several weeks. Yeah, until they rented the apartment and then, on uh, uh, 13th Street. Moved over to uh, 13th, 13th Street, Street in St. Paul. Uh, yeah. And I think you uh, you lived in St. Paul for, what, about eight years? From St. Paul? In, in St. Paul, about 10 years? That's right. Mother died of Hodgkin's disease, apparently. Right. It, uh, I left to start from the history of the mother's sickness in Paris. We were waiting for the visas or something like that, you know. We went to check up. And a doctor find a lump in mother's, in Tanya's breast. So either uh, a doctor, what I knew from Rovna, it yeah, doesn't matter. So he suggested to get a French professor, Ignan, it was his name, to the hospital. It's called Institut de Cancer, it means a cancer institute, but it was not just for cancer, to see what should be done. So he came to our hotel to examine her, and he decided to put her for the weekdays only, Institut de Cancer for Radiation. And this was giving more, in bigger doses like every day. And at the end, uh, checking out from the hospital, he had the x-rays before and x-rays later, the lump disappeared. He says, there's nothing to be done in this period. Then we didn't, you know, she was examined here too. And supposedly there's a scar left, but the doctors agree that it's nothing. They never even mentioned the arch case or something mm -hmm. here in the beginning. Then she had an attack of uh, uh, appendicitis. What the doctor, her doctor didn't recognize her. 
He says it's not urgent. All he says, if it's my wife, I take her to the hospital and I remove the, the lump, uh, you know, the appendix anyway, because it's not needed. So that, but it was happened to be Johnny's uh, birthday. He says, no, we can write lower. You know what? I'd like to have a second opinion. And there is a, a surgeon in St. Paul, maybe still alive, Charles Ray, very famous, the most in the area. And uh, he examined her, you see, and uh, he says it's no appendix, it's no appendicitis. Kind of guarantee you after nothing, your medication, she'll be well and well. It got worse. In two weeks, he took her to the hospital. The appendicitis, the appendix burst, and she died. Now she died from the burst appendix. That's what I say. And that's what they said. They, then they invited some other professors, you know, from the University of Minnesota, and the professor Bernstein told me, yeah. "I want you to know that your wife did not die of Hodgkin. She could have lived at least." the way we saw it. She died from the burst appendix. I thought she yeah. survived that, and it was the a year appendix. later that she died, she died from the not, legions. She died not from the burst appendix. She died 18 months Wait, after the burst appendix. That's what I thought. And Dr. Singer predicted that adhesions are getting on the intestines, and in 18 months you might have an obstruction of the day. See what she did in that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, they mentioned, the, 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 and I tell you, how more the encouraged can you be and say your wife could have lived 50, no influence on our life mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. a normal life at least 15 years, you know. So that's why, uh, and I just want to add, if I have uh, to single out a single tragedy, this will be the, the single tragedy. How did uh, mother adjust to life in the United States? All right, it was a big kind of betterment in our life to getting an apartment in, uh, in St. Paul, uh, plenty of rooms for, you know, even it, uh, even it was now, you know, considered a slum area, but uh, compared with the warriors we went through, this was a uh, luxury. Was, was there anything that you or mother disliked about this country upon arriving? And say the first two or three years? Yeah, you, you, what, uh, we, we liked it already because we came to a normal life. After having been on the run for so many years, uh, did you have any trouble adjusting to the freedom uh, in the United States? No, the life in the United States would be very similar to my life in Europe, except it was Europe, I have a better apartment. Before the know. war, Europe before the war, you Europe mean? Europe before the war, sir. Okay. As an immigrant, was it difficult adjusting in this country? In, in what way? Nobody knows that I'm an immigrant or not an immigrant, except uh, to speak up in English. That was a problem. Well, I mean, the moment you spoke, I suppose someone yeah. knew that you weren't... Uh... They, they know. They always know in the accent, and they always knew, uh, you know, for a lot of reasons, you know, you recognize immigrants. <laughs> Did you... Uh... You get acquainted into good things very fast. Did you earn enough money? to live reasonably comfortably uh, in this United States? The, the first income was 90 cents an hour, and it was enough to have food, but it wasn't enough to acquire furniture or to buy a refrigerator. And I uh, say within five weeks, when I became the head accountant, my salary was $3,600 uh, a year. And after six months, I got $750 a bonus. Do you remember how much rent you paid for that apartment in St. Paul on 13th Street? The, the, uh, starting with $18 a year, a month, and uh, ending with 42 because it was rent control in force. $18 a month rent, huh? Right. Unbelievable. We hired it for 21, but when I came paying the first month rent, the old lady, the owner of the building, says, I cannot take you with 21 a year, $3 back because the rent control doesn't permit Amazing. Then some guy bought the building and in, in, uh, raised the rent from 18 to $42. Then we started looking for a better apartment and we got one on Laurel, if you know, if you remember. I suppose you can remember days when uh, in Europe as a, as a young kid where you didn't even have electricity, did you? 
uh, we didn't have electricity up to 1915. Up, up so, to 1915, yeah, so was not. The you had came, no electricity. No, the German, yeah, no. Uh, twice a day, uh, water guy with a buggy in a big barrel went to the river, got the water, delivered to us twice a day. Was so no there. running water either? No running water either. This is the running water, no, no facilities. No, running in the river? Nothing. No facilities, running in the river. You moved to Chicago in what, 19... 57, right? Yes, right. February. Oh, no, in August, actually. Uh, and the, the job in Chicago was just a continuation of working for the same family, the Harris family, that you worked for in St. Paul, right? St. Paul, we worked for the William Harris and Company, William Harris Wool and Company. And what was your position what? at the end with William Harris Wool and Company? I was the general manager. You were the general the, manager of that company. Years. I see. And in, when you went to Chicago... I was the uh, general manager and the head accountant. What was, your, what was your function in Chicago after you moved from St. Paul? With Irving said, uh, 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 a broker's uh, you know, office. But my job was, was another guy by the name of Carl Zerfus. He was a stock analyst. So Irving suggested, form a company, Joseph Stern and Carl Zephyrs, and you'll do work for me. What is, it wasn't Harris Associate, whatever the name was, was Harris was in the name. And they'll pay us a fee for advising them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This lasted a year because Carl Zephyrs thought that this is not for him. And we dissolved the partnership and we changed it to Joseph Stern and Company, what was up to, up to date. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so you did a lot of accounting and tax returns and... Uh, uh, stock analysis, uh, man arbi managed arbitraging the bonds to stock, you know, uh, something like that. Then, then n not for long, then uh, the head of accountant Nissen went into the bowling alleys. Mm -hmm. So they had accountant to form a uh, IRS agent. And it didn't go, not because it didn't give enough business, inflated expenses, the management it was terrible. And the accountant told that everybody's above him. To me, when I was the head accountant, I think I'm a boss of something. You know, even if it pertains to analysis, accounting or something. Sure. This accounting, very nice guy, he couldn't take it. He was working to So you went over to work with Neeson's operations. So, so Irving suggested to Neeson, well, give us somebody who will straighten out your finances. You know, and, uh, and then, uh, you know, there has to be an improvement for that because the accountant doesn't know what he's doing. The, the main thing was that after five weeks working as an assistant, as a bookkeeper, with the William Harris Wooling Company, I was made, the, the head accountant quit, suggested that Bill Harris makes me, so it made me the head accountant. So It was an improvement, like double your salary. So uh, there, there wasn't anything that you, that you particularly disliked about living in the United States uh, as opposed to living in Europe at that time? All right, if I would compare the, the, in the beginning, the life in St. Paul, or in Europe, I was more comfortable in Europe. You know, From a cultural language standpoint. Language was not a, a problem, a lot of things, and it was, very, it was a very interesting life in Russia. You, you, you spoke no English when you came here to speak of. I mean, no, uh, not to speak of, you know. I know a few uh, words, a few but few words, you yeah. weren't fluid in it, uh, uh, or fluent uh, I, in it. I was a teacher in Warsaw in English for, for a month, but uh, didn't learn anything. When you, when you reflect back on, on your life, uh, and let's, let's say that for the, for six years or pro approximately during the war, you obviously had no, con no control or not much control over it. But beyond that and prior to that and, and subsequent to that, uh, when you look back, would you do anything different? Would you, would you have done anything major that would 
change your life, change your life dramatically, or I, chosen uh, a different occupation, or no, I was very comfortable. Even for a while, uh, I lived in Warsaw myself. It was a very fun, a very interesting time for me living in in a city like Warsaw. <coughs> but it's a big change from Rovno to Warsaw. I used to visit my mother about three times a year. You know, which is, my mother lived in Rovno. <coughs> and uh, helped financially, my mother, two sisters, one was married, my mother's cousin. And my mother was semi-paralyzed on the right side, most of the time in bed. And uh, life for me in Warsaw was normal, like a young man, a uh, bachelor, living in a big city. How about in this country? In this country? Since you, since you came to the United States, would you have done anything differently in no, retrospect? No. To find a job in my, you know, uh, my skills with in, in accounting, was my aim. I didn't look for any job. But suggested by a lot of people, by the relatives and friends of my sister, to take any physical job, like, like the Swift or Armor or Refrigerator. You know, physical job, just sure, working, sure. you know, carrying the, the carcasses, the vans, and I refused. Tell me, any regrets? Anything that you regret not having done? or uh, no, no, not I, I can think of. I think the, the, the way, the, you know, the decisions were made whenever a problem came up turned out to be to the benefits except for the illness of uh, Tanya. How would you like to be remembered? As a good family man, good husband, good father, now a grandfather, and this was my purpose in life. And if you were to uh, impart some uh, <clears throat> so-called words of wisdom to your grandkids, Isaac and Saul, uh, what, what advice, if any, would you give them in terms of living their lives? All right, by now, I didn't have any advice, and I don't give any advice. As you know, the Isaac and Saul, the two grandchildren, uh, one is disappointed today, just got a call, from Johnny that uh, he wanted to be a counselor in a camp, and he didn't make it because he hired somebody else. And on the other hand, he's a research physicist. He's almost, on a not almost, uh, he's a physicist, <laughs> you know. This is the aim, and I'm very pleased in, I don't give them advice at all. You, uh, I know that you uh, place a lot of value in education, and uh, both, I and Joan uh, went through law school, and the boys, the grandkids, uh, one graduated from Stanford, the other one is still there. Uh, how about your feelings about spirituality or religion? I know that you haven't practiced a great deal of, of any religion. How do you feel about that? I feel I, about that I would say normal because it's going on for such a long time. This was true in the, when I lived in Poland or in Ukraine before. It was a Jewish family, but uh, it, the observation was kind of loose. We were not, we were kind of officially Orthodox Jews, but we did not practice Orthodoxy. Would you describe yourself as an atheist? All right, it, it, it kind of close to it. We can say an agnostic. Maybe we will be closer to it, you know. And as you but, get, as, you uh, as an unbeliever, you can tell me. You can, as you become older, are you closer to being an agnostic or an atheist? I I don't know, but uh, people probably the one who do observe, and I am not challenging them. It's uh, kind of. They think it's like insurance, you know. Why not do that? Maybe there is something there. It's like an insurance policy. Yeah, yeah. like I say, They like say there insurance. are no atheists in yeah. foxholes. There are no atheists in foxholes. Uh, I suspect when you get to be 86 years old, almost uh, coming to 87, uh, 
it's it's similar to uh, living in a foxhole. Uh, you never know if it's you're going to survive till the next day or the next week. So even the 80s was a Russian economic under communism. You, the 80s, but they still even the leaders of Russian did not uh, stop using, uh, you know, God forbid, or they are using the word God without even thinking of it. It becomes a colloquial language, you know, something like that. You don't parade, you know. I, I am not uh, what we used to call in, in Warsaw. Uh, even you can classify me as an atheist. I am not a militant atheist. You know, I don't have crusades telling people to. You know. No, I understand that. But you personally are supposed to atheism as, as one can be. Uh, probably, would, the, yeah. would, would existentialism describe you more yeah, closely? Yeah, that's right. You just hit it just right. Existentialism is the closest thing, the closest philosophy, I believe. You know, whether it's popular or not, doesn't matter to me. You think organized religion has done this world any good? No, not the opposite. What person in your life stands out as the greatest person you've either known or heard about or read about? I don't know if you can figure out because there are so many. You know, going back, I would start with Dr. Schweitzer probably. You know, in the current time, I would say Mother Teresa. You know, they're real top-notch, selfish people who always think about a better world. That, that's what my Who is the greatest leader that you can recall? Leader, um, I don't think I don't, I don't think we had a great leader in the 20th century, and I all I lived only in the 20th century, you know. The, the, the historical leaders are not think are not the people I think about. How about a, how about the the philosopher of the 20th century? All right, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Schweitzer, Schweitzer could be including the philosopher. Yeah? And uh, I really don't know, I can't think at the, at the moment, you know. You used to uh, like Sartre? I still, I still like him, but you know, he's a philosopher, he's a good writer too. As a matter of fact, his, his wife, or uh, was it, or not married, or married, doesn't matter. Simone de Beauvoir was the, be the best book on aging. Have you any heroes in your life at this point? To me, I would say because of the Holocaust, the heroes would be non-Jewish people risking their life to save her. And it doesn't matter, this happened to be Jewish, not Jewish, but any time. When somebody risks his life to save another life, is the greatest sacrifice. You uh, raised two kids, and got two grandkids, yeah. and uh, had a long career in the, in the accounting field with uh, the Harrises, yeah, up until so. about a year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you like uh, not working? I don't like it. <laughs> you don't like it. You would rather be working. Yes. At, at 86. Yes. What would you like to be doing? I would like to do what, what, what I did. It doesn't have to be the same, the length of the hours or something like that, or the same routine, you know. You'd like some involvement. And I was, uh, I was yeah, but well, I was, uh, as, uh, as you know, promised by my uh, uh, employers, bosses, that they'll keep me as long as I want. Doesn't matter whether I do anything. And then they're an egg, they don't, they don't cry, so time is going anyway. Well, with any luck, we'll, uh, we'll celebrate the 90th and uh, then the 100th. Okay. And uh, you'll probably get a chance to see some uh, great grandkids, uh -huh. which isn't probably too far away. No. No, Isaac is 23. He, he, he can marry any day and have a child. That's pretty simple. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to add in terms of your life, yeah, in terms of... Else. You know, when you go in, in detail, it will, uh, it will take a lifetime to tell the story of my life, so <laughs> cannot cover everything. Well, we can do it, but then who would watch it, right? Yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> this, I think, right from the beginning. 
Yeah, there is interesting, you know. Like, every, every human being has this own history. You went there and myself from the sub suburban uh, area that we stayed in That's and came right. back to Warsaw. That's correct. Where did you stay in Warsaw when you yeah. came back? Where did I stay? You, you had right? an apartment in Warsaw also? We ever had an apartment. You, you, you said born. we were staying 20 miles away. Uh, so because of the summer. Oh, summer just house. a summer house. A dacha, you would call it. In I see, Russia. just a cabin or something <laughs> like we call it them just here. A, just a cabin. All right, so now you're back in Warsaw. And, and tell me what you remember about the conversations you were having with your, with your co-employees or I, friends. What, was, oh, what were you thinking? There were uh, not many, but there was one more besides me, the two sisters were on it. And I start, you know, with my suspicion that I see, in, in, we moved all the way to offices at that time in another place. Not because it used to be, it has to do with, has to do with the States and something, let's not go into it. All right. And I used to take that, and then I got a little suspicion, and see they are, they, me and my bosses, are looking for transportation to leave uh, Warsaw, go east. And nothing tell me, so I came up and I say, I said, what are you doing? He said, we're going to look, you know, we're going to leave. I said, you're going to leave? What's about me? Just like that. Oh, yes, maybe we'll be able to take you. They didn't even intend. So uh, when I came back home, I told the Tanya, they are looking for transportation. If they don't find, if they find something well, to include us, okay, if not, we take the buggy with a nine months old Arnold. <laughs> And we go east. Within three or four days, you made up your mind to leave Warsaw. Is that right? Absolutely. There was a colonel, this colonel, what I mentioned, was on the radio all the time, that all the male population has to leave Warsaw. We organize an army of defense, but leave, the, leave your wife and your children home. And Tanya said, maybe he's right. Maybe he's right, you should leave. Sir. And I had a simple answer. Tanya? Yeah, I don't understand yet, you know, still nine months old. We live together or die together. If we decide to stay, we stay together. If we decide to live here together. All right. So this was solved. And then, while I'm talking to them, I say, why don't you why don't look together? Why don't I get engaged in looking for transplant? He say, it's a good idea. What are, what are you going to do? I say, I'm going to all the stations where trucks are stopping. You know, yeah. those trucks yeah, yeah. where they sleep and they sleep and everything like that. <coughs> and, see, and find somebody, offer him money, you know, I don't know how much he'll ask. And, uh, and then we'll have transportation to go, to go east. Were there's many Jewish people leaving, leaving Warsaw at that time as, as others? You would never know, this statistic would never be known to me, whether how many Jews left and how many, uh, you know. In yeah, other words, uh, the, the, every day there was bombing, yes? Yes, three times a day. I mean, airplanes coming over and dropping bombs on the city. The, the Messerschmitts, yes. And so, so the, the city is under siege, right? I mean, yeah. the telephones probably aren't working. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. More or less, like 10% on and off. Okay, and, and you, you decided this is not the place to be. We got to get out of here. Oh, no, okay. if, if, if my bosses would not go out. In the even F way out, uh, but was later uh, occupied by the Germans, they all were killed. Let me ask you this. Obviously, the majority of the population yeah. of Warsaw, I'm assuming, stayed. Is that oh, a fair yes. statement? Yeah, yeah, I have a fair statement. The, the majority. The Jews, was Gentiles, not, it didn't make any difference. The city was not deserted by enemies. When we evacuated from Warsaw, yes. to keep up about the transportation, how? We landed in Rovno, in the time from Rovno with my mother, I decided to go further east to the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union came to us. Yeah, I understand, I understand that. But I'm trying to get at why, why you were in the minority 
of those who decided to leave Warsaw. What, what I, I, made I, you decide uh, so soon? I didn't say that I was in a minority. Well, we just said that the Well, min- why we have this transportation, the, the highways were clogged with people working? They were. Yeah, certainly. So people were suddenly refugees overnight. Now let me ask you, let me ask you some practical questions yeah. under those circumstances. You obviously have bank accounts, you know, uh, somewhere, uh, personal bank accounts. Okay. Uh, you didn't keep all your money in a mattress, I don't presume. Yeah. You had an apartment with furniture and furnishings and clothing, like most people normally live. You drop that immediately? We, I mean, you just forget did, about it? Because that's right. We do, oh, me, uh, what do you do? How do you act in chaos? I don't know. I'm asking yeah, you. you know, I've, not, I've not been in that situation. Yeah, you, not been, you don't even try to go to the bank. And we didn't have money in the bank. Wait, wait, so wait. you leave Warsaw, you arrange for transportation, right? Yeah, and this is an interesting story, but we might not go into it. But it was not easy to find a truck for 3,000 zlotys. And I find the truck is the owner and the driver of the truck. is with his family on the station where he keeps them. In he evacuated from Lava, what Lava is the name of a city, what, he, he, what is on the German border, he cannot go back to Lava, he doesn't go back to Germany. So my pitch to him was, you are a refugee already. Your home is in Lava and you left everything. Why not take us? It will pay you well. Mm-hmm. You know. And, uh, and the wife, uh, as I told you, with the family, and the wife came in and talking about, she said, no, maybe we'll stay here. We don't know, she feels kind of, uh, you know, she doesn't feel right that we should go because she says, my husband has tuberculosis and I don't like him to something up on the road, you have no help, maybe in the in Warsaw, no matter who comes, German will get some help, you know. And I told her we are still passing cities and if we need help. Anyway, he agreed. Now the truck I found, there I work in the station and there's the body of the truck but no wheels. Because the police went from station to station and confiscated private trucks. So uh, they took the wheels off? The, 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 the wheels were so hidden that the police couldn't find the wheels here. You know, and they said, we have to do it at night. And we do it at night, it was pitch night. And it's a blackout in the city, so it's really pitch black, you know. And uh, we finally wind up with 48 people. On the know, truck. truck? On an open bed truck? Open bed, an eight ton truck. Uh, with, with sight. You where know. did the other people we come from? Where did the other people come from? Uh, uh, friends and relatives. Of the Raiders? Oh, yes. While on the track, and I sit on the top because we were loading up with a lot of things, and there was yeah, an episode, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you sometime. Uh, we, cro- we go in the street, and a wire crossed the street and hit me to the temple, and I s- fell down right to the pavement. The Raiders were wealthy people, weren't they, by, oh, yeah. sta- by those standards? Millionaires. Millionaires. How did they take, did they take any of their wealth with them when oh, they left? The, the, the wealth, all of what you can carry, all of them in the suitcases. No, but I mean if what? Currency, jewelry, how do you carry wealth? They are buildings How do you carry Italy? millions? You, you, carry, you carry jewelry, gold, and diamonds. When did they have the time to convert their wealth to things that they could take along? What do you mean? They were buying it all the time. I see. They say European thing like that anyway. In other words, that was a custom in yeah, those days. Not had, like in our yeah, in our day, we have bank he, accounts. He, they he had, had the real commodities. Bank in Italy, and, and if he has uh, money in a Swiss bank, he had a certificate. I uh, see. You know. I see. So now, you leave Warsaw. Describe the trip from Warsaw to back to Rovno, which is going east, right? Right. And the, with, the truck which, took us to Kovel. And is, which, at that know, point, became part of Russia because of the non-aggression pact. Rovno was now uh, again non, Russia. Not non, the non-aggression pact. But the non-aggression pact... Between Hitler and Stalin. Uh, in the, 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 the secret protocol to give up half of the right. country. So, to the white so Poland. Poland was divided in half. You yeah. merely went to the eastern half of Poland, where Rovno was, and your family. 
correct? Yeah, my mother, yeah. And t how far, yeah. how many miles are we speaking about from Rovno to Warsaw? Well, we are speaking about 300 miles, close to 300. 300 miles? Because we didn't teach Rovno for Warsaw. It took us another 12 days to come there. Okay. So we made to Kovel about 250 miles. The 100 miles we made on horse and buggy. We were walking within. Finally, we arrived in... In Rovno. Uh, yeah, the, the, the 16th, the 17th yeah. of September. Uh, on the trip from Warsaw now, with the 48 people on the truck, I presume everyone maybe had a suitcase or two at the most? It's a story in itself. All the people, the mostly rich people, try to get as much as they can with them. You come with two, three, four, five suitcases. There was no way to put in luggage of 48 people. I came with two suitcases. I and at a point you say, we can't make it. I say, we are in danger, and it was a danger, that if they bomb the bridges, no way you can go. You have to cross the river in order to go east. Mm -hmm. still, uh, let's hurry up. And what, what, what do you suggest, they say? I suggest we leave a lot of the luggage here, whether we can do it, take the best, the things which you think you'll need more, or something like that. And I was so mad that we, we might not make the trip because of this, uh, the luggage. I went, climbed up on the truck, and I picked up my suitcase, one of my two suitcases, it was three, it never came to. And I say, we should dump our luggage. What about doing right here, you know, what we have, and everybody's got running around like kids, you know. I say, you have five buildings, we'll go to your closet building, what you still own, you know, you never know, you might haunt after a while, and we'll dump it there. And eventually, if we'll be alive, we will come back sometime and get it. And as an example, I took my suitcase overhead and boom, right there from the truck. So a guy, a guy actually is uh, one of the, my boss's uh, daughter's uh, husband. Hey, Joe, the communists are not here yet. You know, you say, all of a sudden, communists. Yeah. What are you, a communist or whatever it is? I say, if you if you live, you'll, you'll get back or whatever it is. If you risk your life by taking another suitcase, we'll never make it. And some people, you know, some people Russia said, you know, it's just right, just right. We dump plenty of suitcases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You better to spoil it to a building they own. They come back and they will start loading. Then a little young girl, you know, from Rosicia, Ukraine, in Apollo, you know, what used to work in Warsaw for the Raiders, because he came from yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As the, you know, living. She has a little, little, little suitcase like this, and start climbing uh, on the truck. So some guy who knows that she's just a maid, hit her over the hand and say, you are not here, this is not for you. Oh, you should see me furious. I say, take your suitcase and come back, I'll put it. You sit down and be on the truck, don't move, no matter who wants to move. And I told the guy, you know, she's so young. They left her family, a mother or father or something like that. And she's all alone. Nobody cares. Would you leave her alone here? All right, so you, you, uh, you, you, you're on the truck now and you're heading back toward the east. Any other incidents uh, that, that occurred? Uh, were, so far, none. I relaxed when we crossed the bridge and I told you the incident that a wire hit me the temple yeah, and I fell yeah. down. So I recovered and I came back, so I didn't go up again. This truck, but I told it's an 80 ton, big, uh, eight yeah. ton big, yeah. big truck, had wide fenders like that, even they are curved. Yeah. I lied down on the fender, and the rest of the, of the trip I was making on the fender. The only thing that was not comfortable, I'm not speaking of that, was that the hot water from the radiator was dripping on my head. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Germans didn't bomb the truck or the roads or... Uh... They, they were bombing, but they, 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 not the places where we were. And then uh, we came to a city only close, 100 miles from Warsaw, yeah. ran out of uh, gasoline. Now you wind up back in Rovno, right? Eventually. Three o'clock in the morning. And, and you spend the next, what, a year and a half approximately in Rovno? 
19 months. 19 months, so that's a uh, year and a half. September 39 to June 22nd, yeah. 41. Okay, and historically, uh, Hitler uh, violates the non-aggression pact in June of 1941, right? That's correct. And proceeds to invade the Soviet Union, be beginning the war against the Soviet Union. Two days he took over. So, so now you're on the move again. Epic. Okay. Now, on the move, on, not far from the Soviet border. All right. So my aim is the Soviet Union. Right. Now, now you have to go how far to get the Soviet Union? Uh, to, to 20 miles what's the, there, 20. what's the safest place at oh, that 20 point? 20 kilometers, I decided That's to walk. All. I didn't even look for transportation. You walked? To walk to, to Ostrog was right on the border. And, and somehow, the, uh, the question in our mind was, would the Soviet let us in? Let me ask you something. Uh, when you went back to Rovno, your mother was still alive. We left her. Your sisters were alive. You had two we sisters? We left her, yeah. Two sisters. We left the two and your mother, and yeah. who else? Mother's cousin. And a what? mother's cousin. Four, mm -hmm. four women. Yes, right. Right. In 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 a husband of one of my oldest sister. I see, and they were going to stay there, uh, hoping to yeah, survive the to war. Stay. I intended to take everybody, but my mother would have died the first time on the track. She was ill. She was paralyzed. Uh huh. The right side. I see. You have to lift up. So my cousin, my uh, my mother's cousin said, you have to leave at least one of the sisters. Otherwise, if you take them both, I'm going to quit too, because I cannot Did you leave, you, you say you walked out of Rovno at that point in 1941 when, uh, when Hitler started no, coming I, east? No, I worked in, an, in a place with, no, where walk, we walk, were in the truck business. Out? We didn't know, listen, you don't understand the answer. I worked in a place where there was the truck business. Uh -huh. We have 20 trucks. So the manager of the outfit, told me, Joe, you can do whatever you want, you can go, I'm never shut up, it's a war, and we don't care. However, if you want to work it, I'll give you to your disposal a truck. I so see. that's why I could take my sisters, my mother, I uh, my mother I couldn't take because of the mother, not because of transportation. Yeah, you're about 35 years old it's at this point. It's interesting, the episode is interesting, because a few months before I changed this job, because I had to change, the KGB is after me. So, a Russian, a Russian, a Russian accountant, the head accountant, um, advised me to quit the job. But you cannot quit, he will write to the manager. The managers, so this is the quartermaster of the Russian Fifth Army. Mm -hmm. You know, so he find, and he was a very old Russian intelligent, and he said they have a problem because they'll be, they say they'll be after you, they'll be after you. However, It'll be better if you change the job. So that's what you did. So, not not wow. easy, so they don't let me go. So, so you find a loophole that they reduce my salary. Uh, you can quit if the salary reduced. Otherwise, you cannot quit. Let me ask you something. As, you, as you're running now from, from, from Hitler, from the German art forces. Second time. Yeah. Uh, What's your, what's your first stop after Rovno? The, where uh, you stayed for any length of time? The first stop, as a matter of fact, was Novograd, was in the city where I Back was born. Back to where you were born. But, but you didn't stay there very for now, long. For now, it's is a big city, and Kiev. Who's driving the truck? You got a driver? Were you driving the truck? Do I, do my disposal uh, is a truck yeah. with a, with so a you, driver. So you're driving the truck? No. You got a driver. The, the, driver's, the driver's driving his own truck, what he drove yesterday. I see. And, uh, Except it's a vacation road. Matter of fact, the, as a matter of fact, they have to be, but this is, you know, not important, that the manager of the whole outfit was a Jew that I met later right. but, but in Israel. How far did you get then? When, 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 when's the first city that you now are Kiev, staying in? Kiev. You go to Kiev. Not the first, the first and the last. We made Kiev. And that's how Africa. far from uh, Rovno? 200 about miles? 200 miles. So now you're in Kiev. In a theater, in a movie theater. You have no home. No. You have a suitcase or two. You sleep on the chairs. And, and that's it. In a theater. In a movie theater. Three weeks. In a movie theater. How long did you stay in Kiev? Three weeks. Just three weeks? Yeah. Only three weeks. Yeah. 
They were already almost, almost in Kiev. You Kiev. mean the, the German army was almost in Kiev? So now you've got to go beyond, right? Not out of okay, where, where do you, how do you get out of Kiev? Train? There was, yes. And the train was for wives and children of people working for the KGB or NKVD at that time. Right, it. right. You know. Now the outfit I worked before. Now how did you get the, on the train? Because I worked before for the for the quartermaster, quarter you know. I see. So now, where does that train? I mean, the company I went to the train. In the new job, the new job was important. Even it was not a, a KGB outfit, but it was under jurisdiction of the KGB because the new outfit where I work is uh, was building roads by prisoners, Polish officers. They had no business. 11,000 of them had got killed in Katyn. You heard about the Katyn Falls. Sure. Yeah. But uh, look, look uh, where, where does this train take you? Where we does know. this train go? The train, the, the guy, the head of the train, a colonel in the army, an NQD colonel, not just a colonel. Yeah. He came in, we went from car to car. We're going to take you east as far as we can and we'll unload you and the first city will accept us. We will stop for places that we can feed you. And I and my friend were the only man, male, okay, on the train. Otherwise it was 100% families of K women and children, or workers of K Canada. Uh, okay, so now the train, the train stops. Where do, where's your next stop? The train stop. I can't remember all the small no, towns. No, no. I mean, where did you finally settle? We'll make it. it we'll make it like for that for any length of time. It took ten days and ten nights to uh, finally. Chilabi says yes, we can take in refugees. Okay, which is a city uh, in what's in, in the, the Ural Mountains? Uh, it's western Siberia. Start okay. the start of Siberia. Okay, it's right at the Euro Mountains in Siberia. Was this a passenger train or a freight train? The train itself was not box cars. It was okay, a passenger train. Yeah, yeah, for women and children. So how long were you in, Sh in Shelyabinsk? We were unloaded at a sports stadium. Yeah. August 11th. And there were already snow flurries. <laughs> yeah, but unloaded there. I start looking and some people in charge of the train start looking and helping us get located to go get a roof on us. Yeah. Like that. So they find us a room and we are loaded with Russian people. How long did you stay there? So w w the next day, the thing to do is we're going to stay in Chilabinsk because we have to look for a job. So we went from office to office and they were desperate for people. Mobilization to the war was up to 55 years. If you're a Soviet citizen, you're 55, you go to the army. So they didn't have anybody to work in a country for them. They were so glad. They showed us that we will have enough to eat. They invited us. It was called the zootechnic, the guy in charge of the kettle. It's a kettle soft horse, not a cold horse. A soft horse, and it's a big difference. A soft horse is like an office, any industry. A coal horse is a cooperative where you are an owner. A farm. A far, yeah, it's the soft horse also manage farms. Yeah, I understand. We, so we, in the said, you know, it's time to eat and to show off, and there was uh, bread and butter and eggs, uh, you name it. Uh, not any was an American breakfast, okay? So we say, we'll take it. And we were three accountants, three meals. How long did you stay there? In the city. Till the time we stayed there till December 10th. December of 1930, 40, no, 41, yeah, 1941. 41. Okay, and why did you leave there? Because most of the Polish refugees, in way of some contacts, decided to go south, that you can go to Tehran, to Afghanistan. Yeah. You know? Yeah. To all, all the places we are right on the border, southern border, uh -huh. not far from uh -huh. India, or something like that. In Siberia, they say, we'll, we'll stay in eventually, knowing the way the Soviets are working. We'll stay until we die. We have, we have no, uh, no place to go and where yeah. to go. Yeah. And because the majority are going there, we decide also to go there. And there where was south? A, south to where? 
What was the destination? Central Asia. So, so fight for the public. Uh, you, you didn't have to leave at that point. You decided that, that was the way of getting Maybe out of the Soviet Union. It was difficult to get tickets. They didn't want to leave. They didn't no, I understand leave. that. But you didn't have to leave because of the threat of the Germans coming. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, I was dreaming at that time, say in Chelyabinsk, and then we went to Novosibirsk, further east to go, to go south, that if the war continues, you know, and the Germans are maybe not so successful, but the Japanese are at that war too. In, in the, in, and I was dreaming that the Japanese will come, probably better to live on the Japanese than to live on the Hitler. You know, because yeah. nobody knew, everybody said Hitler will go past the Euromont, Hitler will go to Siberia. Were you uh, ever, after leaving Rovno, threatened by Hitler again? No. Never? Too far. It was too far. Okay. Hitler was too far So west. you got, how far south did you get? What was the... Uh, the first uh, stop, kind of, or the, or the train went further, was Almaty, which is the capital of Kazakhstan right on the Chinese border. Mm -hmm. Then it starts going west. Are you in a group Tashkent. of people at this point? Our group. The Polish immigrants? No. Or refugees? No, just our. All right, we start in Siberia because in order to go from Chelyabinsk to go south, there is no road from Chelyabinsk. Uh -huh. You have to go another 1,300 miles yeah. to Novosibirsk, which is one of the biggest cities. Right. In Novosibirsk, go south. The train, go the train south. Okay. So, Almaty is the first. Uh, where did you settle for the duration of the war? Oh, we went to Katakurgan, was the name of the city, because some friends from Rovno something were living there. Where is so that? It's good where, to come. What, what province is that in? It's uh, it's Ka 50 miles from Samarkand. I mean, is that is that where? is that Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan? No, no, it's Uzbekistan. It's Uzbekistan. Katakurgan. Right. And. Uh, Spent spent the duration the, the remainder of the war there. No, no, no. Then uh, then they mobilized in the army, and I ran out from the train. And after I ran from the train, I knew where mommy where mommy was. And so I started working in Kyrgyzstan. And the reason I ran down from the train there because I had a friend. There. It's a, it's an old story. It take longer than. Where did you? But but what I'm getting at is where did you finally? stay during the duration of the war till it ended? In, in certain places, like I come from Uzbekistan, I ran out from the train. I went to a city by the name of Osh. Again, a friend. I say, any friend would let you in to go and sleep overnight. You know, it becomes like getting a job and what are you doing? Well, why, why the running? Now, you're not under the threat of Germany anymore. Why the bouncing around from I know one that city uh, to when they, when, when they uh, uh, enlist me, enrolled in, in the army. Well, you were avoiding the Russian army. I wouldn't move if they would not, certainly the Russian army. And I know the train is going back to Siberia. And I decided I'd rather die and I'd go back to Siberia, period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I ran away the train at midnight with a, with a fellow 19 uh, years old and he was in a way a detriment because he had diarrhea or something. And uh, he was afraid. When I make up my mind, you know, I'm very serious. I do it no matter what will happen. I cannot predict <coughs> what will happen. Didn't you? And we had, we had false documents too. Didn't Didn't you spend a good deal of time in some of these cities, though, like nine, nine months, six months, a year, uh, in in uh, Central Asia? All right, in Central Asia, the reason for changing a town was because they investigated our finances, and we got clean. I, as a head accountant, would go five years in jail. My books were locked under the lock. I couldn't, I, I came yeah. to the office, I can't even work. And they got two, two accountants from the bank, a woman and a man, and they read a protocol they've never seen anywhere such well-kept books. No, but what, was, said, the, what was the problem there? That they the were problem was there's a guy, they know that we are selling, so to speak, quotation mark, selling, you know, telling that we got a, a, a cow from them, and it's all go not by meat, it goes by livestock. And we are selling it and we pocket the money, which I was see. true. I see. Dad, you know, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, interesting incidents occur to you uh, during those years during the war when you were moving from one place to another. I remember uh, once you mentioned, and maybe you can elaborate on uh, the time that uh, 
the uh, predecessor to the KGB, the NKVD, uh, arrested you. What were what, what were the circumstances? Uh, the, it, at that time, uh, we already changed our document. Changes. It's another story. If you come to it, I'll tell you why. So I went to the railroad station, not far from the railroad station, was uh, a cotton gin. When you convert cotton into oil, you know, something like that. And there was an accountant. And I know he's looking for also g buying mm -hmm. a purpose. Usually the new documents were documents of Jewish people dying in the camp, called them concentration camp, call them whatever you are, dying in the camp. The reason for that was because in my old document, it was that I was born in uh, Novograd Volinsk. What it means that uh, this belongs to the Soviet Union. So we thought if we keep these old documents, we'll never go back home because they'll say you are a Soviet citizen and that's it. So a lot of people, majority, in the, were the same Soviet uh, identification card as what we have, mm -hmm. is try to buy it. And there was a market on that. I have a friend, the Mintzis, I don't know if you know, probably told you sometime, that he was dealing kind of that. But I say I don't want to know anything, uh, everything about it. We did our own documents, but I don't want to to be in the business of uh, yes, uh, persuaded me that this one time I should go in as accountant and see what I was interested. So I went there, and it's next to the rail station, and there are lugs, you know, got into the rail station. In the in distance from there, what I didn't even notice was a woman, a woman guard with a rifle. So two guys walking by. And I was sitting on the, on, on the log, eating an ivra. It's a, uh, it's a Central Asian apple, you know. Uh, and waiting till the accountant will arrive, because it was not time, it was lunchtime or something like that. And they stopped, and they, they say, what are you doing here? I said, uh, I came here applying to apply for a job in the cotton gin. Uh, as, a, as an accountant, another accountant, so he's not there now. So I'm waiting for him. I say, you know that this is a military object, the, the logs and everything in this area. And you cannot be here. I say, no, I didn't know. You know, excuse me, get up and want to go. I say, you don't go anywhere. You see? 